the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's the way I begin every class that I've ever had in Citrus County. My next activity, because this is opening activities, is to go into a brief moment of prayer for all of us that are on the front line working diligently to make a difference in all of those kids' lives that we touch. So however you choose to pray or have a moment to just reflect, please take this time. Thank you. Now, because the word was activity, I'm going to step into a little activity. I like to encourage all of you to relax, take a seat, including my board members. And let me just say this. As a child, when I would exit a room, whether it was the bathroom, the kitchen, the living room, or my own bedroom, I was instructed to always turn around and reflect and look at the path that I paid. If there was evidence I was in the room, I needed to turn around and go back in that room and leave it in a better state. Make a positive impact is what I was told. So, thinking about education, unlike our competition, public education is required to provide transparency and accountability. And because this organization, there are many organizations out there, as well as individuals, that are driven to make an impact on public education for whatever reason. It could be for self-fulfillment, self-profit, or maybe just a divine purpose. But many companies and individuals have made a positive impact, establishing a strong foundation of growth, while others have left a destructive, costly trail. As an adult, I understand the need for accountability. We must establish clear expectations of performance with reasonable deadlines, followed by polite, purposeful, timely feedback with a focus on improvement. So with that said, because this is an activity, I'm going to have a goal. And the goal is to simply identify the most effective method of folding a towel. So I'm going to ask my board members. I know they all come to this task with a background knowledge that's different from one another, but you get to face forward. You have a different context to deal with, so you've got to turn around, sir. All the way around. Oh, okay. <laughs> please, okay. please put it on the floor, this is sir. Appropriate. Do not touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Please turn around, Madam Chair. I will turn around and put that towel on the floor. And please, Miss Hemel, indulge me. Miss Hemel gets to face forward, but that attorney you over there, he's got to turn his back. And put that towel on the floor, Mr. Attorney. So, with a clear understanding of what the expectation is, the expectation is. They will fold the towels. They will do it effectively and efficiently to the best of their ability, understanding they come to the table with different background knowledge and expertise. With that said, studies show that homo sapiens are able to fold towels in a very brief moment of time with only 10 seconds with total accuracy. So with that said, we have a designated trained timekeeper that will start the clock. Only when I say begin, Will he push the button and will you start? Okay. Any questions about the task that you'll be doing? Yes. <laughs> Do I have to pick this up off the floor? You have, <laughs> you have a challenging atmosphere in, your con in the context of your learning. You're going to have to pick it up off the floor. Any other questions before we begin? Start. Time. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, My mama please. taught me right. <laughs> 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 All right, 
all going to share our final product. Please hold your final product up. Excellent job. Notice. Notice the difference in the final product. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Bell, but we're all triple folders. I'm not a triple folder. Oh, she's okay. She's not. What did you do, Mr. Richard? Did you triple fold? So looking at the variation, <laughs> understanding the difference, <laughs> of a difference <laughs> did they comply with the objectives of the lesson? I went with the directions that I did, you bet they did. So they all did very well. They all made it within it. 10 seconds. So at this point, we've determined if this is a successful group that can move on to the next level, which would be to improve the system. So, we've analyzed, we've reviewed, and we walk away feeling good about our accomplishments. As a teacher and as a parent, I understand the need to provide guidelines to ensure the described outcomes Withhold, without hindering the creativity and ingenuity of our children and our staff. Of our children and our staff. So giving them clear guidelines with reasonable deadlines and allowing them the flexibility to be created is so critical when it comes to the success of our school system. As a policymaker, I definitely understand the importance of analyzing the impact of our word choices. I understand the need to provide a safe environment for staff and students to be able to really truly explore the different creative strategies in order to solve the problems that face education. As we move through each room and each challenge, we must take the time to reflect and evaluate our own impact. I can assure you, when I leave the bathroom here at the district, I look back and I see what the impact was. And I'll tell you this, the toilet seat lid is down. The sink is wiped out. And I polish the faucet. And let me tell you something, I turn off the light. So, I'm going. Well, you want <laughs> <laughs> and here's my point. <laughs> here's my point. No matter what your title is, no matter what your job description is, we all have a value, and we, our voice needs to be brought forth. And I have had such a pleasure as I've gone through some of the different schools to be able to hear some of your voices. And I need you to understand that I appreciate when the towels are folded. I appreciate when the trash is emptied in that bathroom and the, the mirrors are wiped down and I certainly appreciate the fact that I don't have to empty the trash. I ask as we all move through life that we please respect the efforts of others. We need to understand that there are many ways to complete a job. We need to appreciate the details of the completed tasks and simply strive to add our own personal creative touch so that we may leave our school system better than we found it. It's just that simple. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for pulling my towel. I, I thought that was the whole point. I should have brought the whole bathroom along. That's it. We need a motion for the adoption of the agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Go, no, go. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 5 0. Do we have any citizens' comments? Seeing none. Need to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Dorchman and a second by Ms. Balfour. Do you have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Recognition of donations, Ms. Bergerami. Yes, Ms. Bryant. We have several donations on the consent agenda today. Approve a $500 donation to the Kanto High School from Cedar Covey. $1,000 donation to the Kenton High School from Scott and Lee. $1,366 donation to Homosass Elementary School from the Woman of Sugar Mill. A $2,000 donation to Homosass Elementary School from Target. A $1,000 donation to Homosass Elementary School from Homosass Again Fish Club. 
$500 donation to Crest from Walmart Corporate, $4,000 donation to the Wichita Technical Institute from Citrus County Education Foundation, Inc. And the last one is $1,000 donation to Citrus High School from Tidwell Brothers Paving of Home Thank you very much. And thank you to all those donors. Okay, now we have a presentation. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Mangan, District Manager of the North Coastal Region with Duke Energy. It's good to be here again. This seems to be my annual visit, and uh, I always like that you are happy when I come, because usually it's recognizing our partnership of our annual award from our grant from the Duke Energy Foundation for $20,000, which is part of our presentation today, but we have two surprises for you. And the first one is, as part of our merger with Duke Energy, we were allowed to participate in a workshop in Colorado where we would choose one teacher in each state of our service territory to attend who was interested in environmental education. And this is part of Duke Energy's interest in sustainability and the environment in education. And Duke Energy is very supportive of public education. So when I heard about this, um, I immediately thought of Citrus <coughs> County and of your teachers. And I am pleased to tell you that for Duke Energy Florida, and you know we're one of the newest um, acquired states for Duke Energy, the first teacher selected is from Citrus County. Mm. And that is Deanna Hadley All from right. Citrus Springs, and she teaches sixth and seventh grade science. And we sent her to a week-long workshop on sustainability and education in Colorado this past June. And so I've invited Deanna to share her experience, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it too. So please welcome Deanna Hadley. Good afternoon. I am Deanna Hadley. I attended the Keystone School Summer Institute in June. I want to thank Duke Energy for sponsoring my trip to Colorado. The activities I learned were aligned to Common Core standards, along with each of the core subjects benchmarks. This experience was marvelous because I was able to get away for a short trip, see the beautiful Rocky Mountains, and able to learn real life science activities that will be incorporated into my classroom. Each of the activities, students are engaged in well-designed scientific progressions and practice with scientific laboratory equipment. While utilizing the Key Issues curriculum, my students will collect and analyze data, participate in real world simulations, explore local environmental issues, and work in groups to solve problems. Now I will have to get moving to write some grants so that I can purchase the laboratory supplies and equipment needed to incorporate these activities completely. I would like to take my students on a field experience to collect water samples from local rivers so they can investigate real life water quality monitoring with the specific scientific equipment. I was able to work in different groupings with other educators from across the country and Canada to collect water quality samples from the Blue River in Breckenridge, the Dillon Reservoir, and from local groundwater wells in Silverthorne, Colorado. All of the activities I participated in were structured towards identifying and solving local environmental issues, water quality, quality testing, and identifying ways to take action on environmental issues. I used scientific laboratory equipment to test the different water samples for the causes as to why certain townspeople were getting sick. I role played and participated in a mock town hall meeting for all the community members concerned about environmental issues. One activity I will incorporate is called Community Development and Sustainable Design. Students will work in groups, create a proposal for their company to be chosen to build an eco-tourism tram that would ferry tourists to three local attractions. I plan to modify the activity for local environmental establishments, namely the Marine Science Station, the Crist River Archaeological Site, and the Chris River Preserve. The tram would originate from an imaginary hub located at the Fort Island County boat ramp. The groups will be given a set amount of money to spend and will have to purchase supplies and build their support structures based on local and state regulations for local wetlands. Students will also be responsible for keeping financial records of their spending along the way. Moreover, while I was in Colorado, I went on field experiences. I visited the Keystone Science School where I witnessed about 20 elementary age kids preparing for an overnight hike up the mountain and a different group of 20 middle school age kids returning from their overnight excursion. 
I participated in a geocaching activity at the Keystone Science School. Once our group figured out how to move based on the GPS coordinates, we quickly found our three envelopes, then went back to the classroom and completed a map a map reading activity based on the pieces in the envelope. One night we were supposed to view the stars using the science school's 14 inch telescope, but the high altitude weather did not cooperate. I walked about a thousand feet into the Country Boy Mine, a local tourist attraction, to see where possible water pollutants might have originated from. I was able to participate in an early morning walk along the Continental Divide at Loveland Pass, elevation 11,990 feet, to watch the sunrise. I learned how to use people to graph responses to open-ended questions, plus new ways to graph data by using 3D graphs. In closing, I would strongly suggest for other Citrus County science educators to attend the Key Issues training. There is nothing like experiencing elevations over 9,000 feet, meeting and working with educators from across the nation, and bringing home some extraordinary real-world activities with precise laboratory equipment that can be incorporated into the middle school science classroom. Thank you again, Duke Energy, for sponsoring me to have an experience of a lifetime. Thank you. That's wonderful. And um, we'd like to celebrate also uh, our grant award. And you already have the real check, but we thought you might like a memento. <laughs> and that is for the $20,000. But I would like to share our second surprise. Uh, it's a delight for me to work with Citrus County Education and the Public Ed Foundation so much, in fact, that we want to help teachers like Deanna be able to get those kits and to do a little bit more. So we'd like today to present you with another check, and that is for a one-time award of $75,000. And we hope that you can award that continuing the STEM tradition, but perhaps maybe for at-risk students that can be inspired for teachers like Deanna. So it's interesting, I heard her comments that she needed some, maybe apply for some grant money. Hmm. I might know of where you might could apply. So if you would like to join me, I have two big checks for you, one for 20 and one for 75,000. <laughs> Our photographer, he could probably do it for you too. Madam Chairman, Mr. Kuhn, would you hold up for a second? Madam Chairman, can I uh, just indulge the board for one moment? Sure. Um, Mr. Kuhn, could you come forward for a second? I actually uh, had on my notes to tell a story um, about Mr. Kuhn and a student later on, but I, boy, it'd be a whole lot better hearing it from the horse's mouth. No, no disrespect, by the way. <clears throat> um, one of the benefits I have of being a uh, spouse of a teacher is spending some extra time at sometimes at her school, walking the halls or, or just picking things up for her or running a honeydew list. And there's a student there that actually several of us board members have met when we did the iPad um, walkthrough about a year ago. And um, we won't mention the name right now, but it's an ESC student that has a special place in my heart. And Mr. Kuhn has a very cool thing and a very popular 
event that he has uh, done here called the Beatbox Competition. And again, being a, a you know, there's, there's eyes and ears everywhere, Mr. Coons. So this story came to me by my wife, who it came from someone else. But Mr. Coon, could you share with the board what took place at that event and then what subsequently happened? Because I do think this board that supports ESE supports this particular student has a person with them throughout the day. But this is what our students, our students are <laughs> happening in our schools. So um, in, in lunches, we like to, to have a little fun with our students and to keep them busy from the noise level getting so loud, we decided to have a, a beatbox competition. And, um, it's where the students come up and they get on the microphone and they get to put on a little 30 second routine of making sound effects with their with their mouths and, and they have to, then the rest of the cafeteria votes them thumbs up or down if they make it to the next round. So before every student comes up, I ask them, you know, off the mic, are you gonna be okay if people don't vote you through, if you know, this is kind of CYA for me. And uh, they said, no, no, I'm good. So as we're doing the competition, I can see this particular student, he's raising his hand, I wanna go. And I'm trying to ignore him because I don't know if he comes up and the students don't vote him through that, you know, it could be devastating for them. So as they go through this, the rest of the cafeteria, the students kept saying, hey, you, you forgot him. You didn't pick him. And I said, okay, well, this could be a career ender right here, but we'll go ahead and <laughs> give it a shot. So the student come up and he, he participated and uh, the whole cafeteria, all the students stood up, gave him a thumbs up. He put his hands up in the air. I'm a champion. He made it to the next round. And then the next day we got to the, on Friday, we got to the championship round. He came up again, he did his routine. And the young man that was with uh, competing with him leaned over and said, can we just give him the championship? So we did, gave him, a, we presented him an award at our prep rally of the beatbox champion. And he got teary eyed, he cried, you know, and we was so excited to share with everyone that he had won this competition. And still to this day, he still talks about it. So it was very, it was a very heartfelt moment for everybody in the whole cafeteria for the students to recognize him that way and give him that opportunity so it was very nice that's awesome yes, it was. thank you mr coon thank you for doing that thank you for having a leadership that that school that those students care about one another thank the way they do yeah, uh, mr yeah, bradshaw has told me that we've got to vote to accept that money could i have a motion please i'll vote for the lovely twenty thousand dollar uh, donation and the seventy five thousand dollar donation from the Duke energy uh, Second. We have a motion by Ms. Storchman and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. How are we going to uh, de define uh, the 75? Yeah. <laughs> um, Ms. Long, I've been working with debt services. Um, she had called us a few days ago. Mr. Long, you're not paid. Hey, you're not in this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the third check. Uh, and we were talking about some of our average programs that some of our schools were trying to do after school with transportation and things like that. So um, Donnie Brown had met with us several weeks ago. She's trying to bring in some of our lower level students. And the, as we all know that transportation can be costly. So we may let her try to do something as a pilot because the other elementary schools are kind of wait to see how it works and how many kids show up in those types of things. So, so it's going to be science related? Some of that will be science, but some of it will be here for some of our lower <coughs> and math, so the science and the math. And, and it's going to be elementary school? We're going to do something at all levels. So we'll keep you posted on what we do. <laughs> and I know that um, the man, Alex, um, I don't forget his last name, yeah. but when <coughs> his heart strings are all about at risk kids. So. Um, that was a conversation we had that he really wanted to, you know, we were kind of focused on. He's the Duke Energy President of Florida. It's funny how they have money. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having their conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, oh my. So we got a 5-0 vote to accept that money. You got that? Okay, good. Mr. Blocker. Yes, uh, first item is to approve the budget amendment number 10 for June 2013. They amended June 2013 budget amendment. Okay. okay. 
a motion by Ms. Powers and a second by Ms. Balfour. Do you have any questions, comments, concerns? There's just a few items that we had to uh, reclassify to close out the year. We had done the majority of them uh, the previous month that we brought to you. These were just the last couple months before we approved the AFR. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, the next item is to approve the annual <coughs> report for 2000 for the year in the June 30, 2013. You received two, uh, one copy, I believe, on Tuesday, then the final one on Friday. The second one that you received on Friday, that's the one that has a lot of information that consolidates and meets all the GASB rules to in, in effect uh, incorporate depreciation and incorporate the other than uh, post-employment benefits that we really don't use on a day-to-day -day basis but for the GASB rules we have to do that but for the one you received on Tuesday is the one that's probably more valuable to you that shows you the funds and the, and the, uh, the revenue on each fund and the, the fund balance etc so on the ESE the elementary secondary education form 348 as Ms. Powers and I learned the ESE what that meant this week um, on the page for revenue for the general fund, you can see revenues totaled $104,518,060. Uh, <clears throat> and then your expenses totaled of $115,153,067, essentially a $10.6 million deficit. You go to the the subsequent page, page three for fund 100, which is the general fund. There are some transfers in from the capital fund that essentially uh, uh, equal about 6.2, 6.3 million. So the net change in the fund balance as we reported to you previously, it was about a, a, a negative 4.3 million, 4 million, 3, 371 thousand. So that's what we had reported to you previously and that is in the fact what happened to this uh, last fiscal year. Um, as, as you know, I've showed you several graphs that show the use of the fund balance over the last couple of years, and, and I will repeat myself one more time that says that, you know, this, essentially, hopefully we're, we're coming out of that, that, uh, that issue of using the fund balance. We can start getting back into a positive, um, positive way as far as having a, a net surplus at year end instead of a net deficit. And we're, although you'll see in the, when we do the budget uh, this, this evening, we, uh, we are not there yet, but we are much better, much, much better than we were in years past. So we're starting to, to come through on making that change in the use of the, of the dollars that we have saved for rainy events. And I mean, somewhat that's what the fund is for. Uh, your food service uh, fund, in essence, you had a total revenue of about 6.7, 6.8 million, and you had expenditures about 6.5. So in essence, food service had an excess uh, or a net surplus of about $259,000, which is one more time the food service department has excelled in, in the management of that business operation, which helps us then, we put back that surplus into the schools, we do some upgrades in the cafeterias with tables, we do upgrades in the kitchens with equipment, so we put that money back into the schools to upgrade them, that's what we typically do with that. Um, your other federal projects essentially uh, should come out to around a net zero. In this case, we had about 10 point, uh, $10,155,000, and it's in essence about the same. So you're, we had a $280 deficit. That could be some timing issues with how we, re we receive our federal dollars. The federal funds are typically cost reimbursement. You spend, you receive. So they always come out to about a net zero. Can we have a negative balance on any one of these? Based on timing, you may have it for the federal funds. I mean, you'll get the money back the next year, next month, or whatever. It's just timing when you receive dollars when you're reporting <coughs> your expenses. Um, 
we do have some race to the top. That's what is uh, Mr. Clauder uh, manages, and uh, those dollars are still there for uh, implementation of all the race to the top initiatives. And about revenue is about two hundred thirty-three thousand, and. Um, Mr. Blocker, in, in order to access those funds, those still, they require the submittal of those paperworks. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, there's there's time involved any time we, the race we submit the, for those. Yeah, and the race to the top fund is essentially one of uh, heavily managed. Mr. Clauder has to ask for, I believe, quarterly. Is that correct? Only deliverables. Every quarter, they have to uh, submit their deliverables, submit any changes before they can actually draw down the funds. So that's probably one of the most heavily managed programs that the state has on us <clears throat> for those dollars. So we have a few dollars. I think this year, maybe the last year for Race to the Top, is that correct? It is. We've actually requested two cost extent, no cost extensions. And uh, one of them is for our MOU number two, and that is for the uh, biomedical, and then the other one is for the hardware access items. It is extremely managed, so. Um, and the presentation is not that at all. Yeah. Discussion of it is <clears throat> the paper. Right. Yeah. It is mm. probably one of the most heavily oversighted programs we've ever seen. So any one program that starts with a gun place yeah. to your head. Okay. A lot of men have men have Oh yeah. Yeah. From Mr. Clauder and the finance department actually happened to account for everything. Any specific questions you have about any of the information? I just need a little clarification yep. again. I want to thank you for sure. answering all my questions prior to the meeting. Um, looking at the capital improvements with local revenue, under local revenue, um, this wonderful multi page document. Yeah. If we just put it under the local revenue where it says capital improvement fees, it's item number 464 yep. for $35,798. Right. This is, right, because they don't earn capital dollars as the state, which we used to get PICO dollars, and then those dollars were generated from FTE. With the adult ed courses next door, they don't generate uh, the uh, capital outlay PICO dollars. Of course, none of us get PICO dollars anymore. They're gone. So the state allowed them to add a cost associated with their tuition that would be for capital improvement. So those dollars are earmarked for WTI for capital improvement projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any further questions or comments? It's our uh, one category 3493 would uh, bring more money next to the sale of junk. <laughs> I know the sale of junk. We do try to sell, sell our uh, surplus. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't categorize yeah. our, our Yeah, we name. don't. We don't need to label the category. No. Do we have a motion? I'm going to motion by Ms. Storchman and second by Ms. Powers. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Human Resources, Mr. Bishop. You just have this one thing. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Good afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'd like to request the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as outlined on the board run. Balfour and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Planning and Growth Management, Mr. Dixon.
first agreement is a memorandum of agreement between the University of Florida for the Florida Automated Weather Tower at Lacanto High School and the Citrus County School Board. I'll give you a little bit of background on this. This is basically a, a weather station that they approached us about a year ago or so and they were looking for a centrally lo located uh, site and they chose uh, Renaissance and asked if they could place it there and we had some issues because of the future plans for that particular area and because it was an agricultural weather station uh, we approached Lacanto High School and they agreed that it would be a real benefit to their ag program to put it there. They already have a little weather station on the greenhouse and this will do a lot more than what that weather station will do. This is a uh, facility that is uh, internet based so you can get on the internet you can pull up uh, all of the information that's gathered at that location and it has historical graphs and that sort of thing so it can be used by all of our ag facilities and uh, the school's good with it and we just recommend that the board accept this in a, a agreement and if you have any questions about it I'll be glad to answer them. I didn't have a couple questions. One size of the side, the height of the vents, and the insurance? They will have to, uh, they are self-insured, just like the school board is, they're a, a public institution, and they will be required to pro provide a certificate of insurance when they place the structure on the property. They've also provided a set of engineered plans that meet wind load requirements, and they'll get a permit through our building official, and I have a set of those plans if you'd like to look at them. But they're signed and sealed. And uh, what was the other question? That's my type of fence and the size of the plot. Yes, we will have to mutually agree on the space and the peak and the map that you have in your packet is where we tentatively agreed to, and it will be fenced at their expense, and it'll probably be a six foot fence. And that's what we have at the Maybe a four foot fence, but it won't be. the reason it's fenced is so the cows can't get to it. So it's not <laughs> It'll be inside our fenced in area. But the no, but you know what's out with the sliding over here. Yeah. Because it has there. wires and that kind of thing that they can chew into. So that's the reason. It's I think three foot, though, we have a lot of high schools. I know Crystal River, when I take the Ethan in it, it's three foot that they have. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, I meant about the normal fence size. But they do have the six foot. For the temporary tower out there now that's not passed, but this one will be passed. Do I have a motion? Uh, I'd like to move enthusiastically because I'm excited about this. I just think it's going to be a great, great opportunity. So I'm sorry. I'm I don't expect it. I don't mm -hmm. A motion by Mr. Kennedy, an enthusiastic motion. I'm going to uh, move the right. <laughs> I'm going to move that we approve the memorandum of agreement uh, with the University of Florida for the Florida Automatic uh, Automated Weather Network Tower to be located at Lacanto High School. Okay. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Deutschman. Now that he made the motion, sorry, Ms. Powers. I'm sorry, I was born all along, and I... <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor. Uh, uh, motion carries 5-0. <laughs> our, our next item, and incidentally, we are taking the one of the directors from the IFAS office in Gainesville on a tour of the Marine Science Station in October. So they may be interested in partnering with the school board. The, the IFAS office in Extension, it's the University of Florida. Oh, okay. It's the same office. It's the same office that has the tower. Mm -hmm. The next item on your uh, agenda is an interlocal agreement regarding wastewater system improvements at Floral City Elementary School and Citrus Springs Elementary School. This interlocal agreement would effectuate the relocation and expansion of the Floral City Elementary wastewater treatment plant to accommodate 810 student stations, convey the plant to the Board of County Commissioners to become a county utility and guarantee the future level of service at the level necessary to accommodate planned utilization of the facility at 810 student stations. It would also effectuate the removal of the Citrus Springs Elementary Wastewater Treatment Plant and installation 
of a lift station and infrastructure necessary to connect Citrus Springs Elementary to the existing county utility regional wastewater treatment plant in Citrus Springs. This would eliminate the final two remaining on-site sewer treatment plants at the schools and the need for licensing and maintenance. It would result in lower operational costs and significantly reduce risk to the Citrus County School Board. To give you a little bit of background on this, we had some discussions with the county um, department that oversees the utilities several years ago about the possibility of extending a sewer line down to Floral City to address some issues that they had down there and the school would be the main customer. And uh, that was, there was a study that was done that was, uh, we participated in, but the county paid for. And it was decided that it wasn't really financially feasible at the time to run a, a line all the way from the city of Inverness, where the airport is, where their plan is, all the way down to Floral City. But the county has significant issues in that area and they wanted to find a way to to address those and because the school <coughs> project has been planned for many years and we're going to have to relocate the sewer plant anyway uh, it was decided that you know they were in favor of uh, first it was thought that we could own the plant and they could use it but then we decided it was better for us if they just own the plant and we become the customer because then they can expand their customer base until they have enough customers and then run the sewer line down from Inverness <coughs> facility. So it's a, a beneficial project of both uh, the Citrus County School Board and the Board of County Commissioners. The reason we're using impact fees to pay for 60% of it is because it expands the capacity of the plant to accommodate 810 student stations. And we're only using impact fees to pay for the expansion part of the project, not the replacement part of the project. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Have any motion? Um, I'm going to move approval uh, that we approve. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking here. Approve uh, execution of an interlocal agreement with the board county commissioners on the water, the wastewater plant for Floral City and Citrus Springs Elementary. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Powers. Further questions? Wait, wait, where's Citrus Springs Elementary? Okay, because it was such a benefit to the county and they were um, they felt we felt like that we should address that issue as well our sewer your sewer plant operator is close to retirement and we will have to find another way to deal with citrus springs at, after he retires we either have to contract that out or hire another sewer plant operator so we wanted to address both and the way this agreement is structured, we, the school board, would actually do Floral City, and the county would actually connect Citrus Springs. They would be the, the overseer of that project. We would be the overseer of Floral City. So when you look at the finances, it, um, the cost of the school board would be basically the lift station at Citrus Springs. Citrus, are, are other residents in Citrus Springs using our sewage treatment plant? Mm -hmm. So why would the county want to have a sewage treatment operator at our school site? No, they wouldn't. They they were we taking hook into their system. Oh, we would have. Yeah, it's like a mine. It's several. What are we doing right now, though? We have a sewer. We have a sewer plant. So we'll so we get rid of the sewer. Floral City and Citrus Springs are the only two we have left other than the AES or the uh, Wayne Science. Wayne Science, yeah. And that one's just been you upgraded that a few years ago. And it's not actually a sewer plant, but it's an aerobic sewer system, which is, and we did check on the, the progress of the City of Crystal River sewer program, but it's still a few years out. So we'll, we'll be in the sewer business a little while longer there. So with this, we'll no longer have any- Any sewer plants. Sewer plants in our existing schools. Right. So does that mean to, um, that will that FT? I mean that that particular. I remember that that this employee was or that um, position was coming up for retirement. I believe so. This will then fade that out, and that position we won't need as far as to maintain uh, the uh, marine science station. Will that be just something we can contract out to to monitor? We can just use our staff. Exactly. The, the maintenance on that is a lot less. 
Yeah, and that's what I thought. It's just an aerobic system, not a, a full sewer plant. Um, Mr. Dixon, I appreciate you coming out and doing this because I, I pulled this because I, uh, I know how much energy you spent on this, um, how much uh, Mr. Block and your team has been working on this. We've really been waiting for the Board of County Commissioners to decide how they wanted to proceed on this. And I do appreciate the Board of County Commissioners working with us because I think we kind of try to approach it a lot of different ways. But this is a great example of why impact fee monies are doing our students a very positive benefit and the ad valorem taxpayer a positive benefit. This is a quarter of a million dollars that is being used to fund new infrastructure, but is providing us an immediate benefit, both in cost of operations to our schools, as well as really we had a situation at Floral City that we are landlocked there as far as with that, that current system that we have in place. Um, am I correct that this would accommodate us uh, should this board find itself in the future of expanding Floral City or needing to um, improve Floral City, that this would allow us those, those additional? Yes, this, this would be the first step towards putting in a bigger cafeteria, expanding the school core uh, capacity, or adding additional classroom space. And is this now project, and I, and I know because it's gone a little bit back and forth in conversation, they, the county will will take this over? Will they take title to it, or are we, ta are we maintaining it? That part I wasn't a little unclear on. In Floral City, the county will actually own the plant until such time as they don't need it any longer, and they'll decommission it and return it back to the school board and put in a lift station. But for the period of time where they utilize it as a public utility, they will own it and be responsible for it. So, but it's not cost No, they will, they will collect, um, they will have other customers in downtown Floral City, for example, uh, in the downtown area who pay for sewer service and it'd be just like any other sewer plant with a public uh, utility. And we will be a customer. So but we will pay a monthly bill. Well, we're taking money out of our pocket to No, actually, we're we're not. We're getting uh, counties paying everything but what the impact fees pay, oh, okay. no, and then uh, we become a customer, How and much? they guarantee us capacity up until the time when we expand the school. Even if they have customers that utilize that facility, and there's no capacity available, then they will be obligated to provide capacity. So they'll have to expand it, or you know build another uh, option for us. So what's the cost of the county? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a table in here that lays out all the costs, projected costs, and it's uh, exhibit C2, project cost breakdown, and you can see where, where the uh, Do you know what fund that's coming out of the county level? Because I, we, I've talked for years with um, various county commissioners, there, and that's my district, and the county commissioner represents that district, about the different ways of doing this, and it's supposed to be more quality money, and that disappeared, and involved in the funding, and that disappeared, and so they were kind of like off the table as far as being involved at all. So $245,000 is coming out of somewhere. It'll come out of the utility. They have funding for only it can only be used for the you know, wastewater system so as far as funding from their side they have to recoup that money and uh, they can't they won't be taking it out of the general fund it'll be just the county utility water quality and when does this come on your agenda i think it'll be the, it'll be the next meeting If they don't approve it, then we'll come up with a plan B. And I think in our case, we've been in a situation that where we have a declining sewer plant that's going to need to be addressed as far as the replacement of it, irrespective of what the county decides. 
Yes, I mean, we have been planning to move the sewer plant ever since we purchased the additional right. land for, the, for that purpose. It really has to be moved. So it needs to be moved away from the school, mm -hmm. and, and then we will be able to take some steps to improve the facility and make it bigger. But this is something we, we have planned on doing for over 10 years, and uh, it's a way to do it. The other thing, um, and, I, and I know as I've walked around there at different times, you can actually s smell the from the plant, which isn't very pleasant. Um, but one of the things that why the, the Board of County Commissioners, I think, have had their own desires, and you know from being down in the district, is some of the businesses there haven't been able to either expand or improve because I think one of the businesses actually pumps out their septic there in order, yeah, in order to, to maintain it. So they're, they feel like there's also an economic benefit, I believe, to to try and do that and to utilize that. So I think there's there's certainly, and I and there's also adjacent areas they can tap into. So I think they do see a, a small revenue source there to fund that. Well, yes, that's where their revenue would come from. They would collect it back over a number of years from their customer base, but there's really a benefit for the county to have sewer service in that area. Um, and again, I just got to say, you know, over a quarter of a million dollars in ad valorem taxpayer money is not going to fund this, and it would have potentially had to go to fund this. Uh, so I, again, I appreciate the work of, uh, of all of our district people involved in, in negotiating this, and Chuck, I'm sure you'll be glad when this is done, because you've spent quite a bit of time on this. We've hit this off the table so many times. Yes, we have. So, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. All right. Moving on to policies. Uh, this is, uh, next item is request to advertise for a public hearing at November 12, 2013 school board meeting to approve the revision of policy 2.21 organization and officers of the board. Um, Mr. Dixon, could we just combine three, four, five, and six? I do that, Mr. Bradshaw. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We've worked, we've worked out these and. Mm -hmm. So these have been worked out with the set the public hearing. So uh, do you want me to go through them individually and ask if there's any questions and you make one motion? That would be fine. Okay. Are there any questions regarding the changes noted or the mm -hmm. citation in section uh, 2.21? The next one is uh, policy 2.90. This is a request to advertise for a public hearing as well. This is the tobacco policy where you added some language regarding e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And this was recommended by the health department. And uh, this was discussed at the workshop. Are there any questions on this one? Okay. Just as a side note, uh, not that it would change our position one way or another, but 75% of uh, people polled on a chronicle poll said they wanted us to to move in this direction so all right yeah yeah it was not one the next one is policy 4.11 student progression plan you had some Discussion on this at the workshop. Again, this is a request to advertise for public hearing on November 12th. Are there any further questions regarding this change? And the final one for public hearing or to set the public hearing is 7.70 purchasing and bidding. Any questions regarding this particular policy for your vision? Yeah, very detailed. Thank you for the detail. Thank you. Can I have a motion for items three, four, five, and six? Yeah, I'll um, move approval of um, advertising and public hearing on November 12, uh, 2013. Changes to policy 2.21, 2.90, 4.11, and 7.70. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Dorchman and a second by Mrs. Powers. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. 
Are we really going to do a budget update? I just want to give you Come on. a brief update before the 530 public hearing to okay. the budget to really not many, not much change from the tentative budget and the, and the conversation we've had uh, all year. But in essence, uh, the tentative budget that you approved in July was about $218 million, and this budget tonight will be about $222 million. With the real difference coming in, the extra federal uh, programs that were added in, either through the rollover dollars or the new um, um, uh, money that we received, you know, whether it be IDA or Title I, et cetera. Those are the real big changes uh, to the budget in and itself. The capital plan does include those two projects that we spoke about previously, the uh, Christopher High School gym and the, and the Forest Ridge uh, um, air conditioning system. So those are the two changes to the to the um, capital plan, and like I said, the only real changes to the uh, the entire budget itself was those federal programs. But if you will go to page 43, it is the the, the pro forma report that y'all like to look at, um, which kind of tells us for the fiscal year 2013. It does show that same um, change in the fund balance of 4.37 million. But for the proposed budget, you can see that uh, proposed revenues are about 116 million, with the um, expenses around 117.9 million. For a change of about 1.4 million is the uh, change in the uh, fund balance. So we do meet the uh, in total with the undesignated fund balance. We do meet the board requirement at 3.69 percent of, of the general fund revenue that we're coming in at. Now this is certainly better than years past because um, like last year we lost 4.3 million and before that it was about 4.7 so we are coming in much better. So hopefully we're starting to see the light in the tunnel. I hope we are to start coming around and, and getting back into a positive net position. Um, I also wanted to have Chuck speak to y'all about the five-year work plan. He, um, he did um, and him and Ms. Wilson actually put together the five-year work plan with the financials that we submit to DOE as well as some projections. I just wanted him to talk to you about projections as far as out years and looking at you know potential new uh, new schools. It does show that we might need a new elementary school 10 years out. That changes every year because remember we, uh, a couple of years ago we've been building it this year but there is some 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 growth potential in the uh, out years. So in reference to anything else for tonight's public hearing, do any other questions about the budget? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And Is Chuck, you said Chuck's going to come Yeah, he's going to come around. But I don't know if you any other questions of me with this with this budget. Not standing, John. Thank you. And everyone got it on that Tuesday. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Very detailed. Thank yeah. you for all your right. hard work. Very good. And Chuck, if you don't mind. <clears throat> First, I'd like to preface what I'm about to say by saying that this is not a science. <laughs> no, this is not. A <laughs> but um, many of you are familiar with our Monday morning report that we do for the uh, schools, and I'll give you a copy of this so you can have it for this Monday. And this kind of tells you where we are right now. And I'll go over it. It's by grade level. It shows you what the enrollment is, uh, what the capacity is for the school. And the last paragraph there tells you what the utilization rate is. So, for example, Central Ridge Elementary is at 95% capacity. Citrus Springs Elementary is at 88% capacity. And so on. It goes all the way through. And it even averages it for the districts. And we look at this every Monday morning and see how it changes. And as a general rule of thumb, you know, I've noticed in the six or seven years that we've been doing this is that the elementary schools go up, the middle schools stay pretty flat, and the high schools go down as the year goes on. And that right after the first of the year, they all change a little bit. So when people move, they tend to move in the middle of a school year around the, in the break period. So uh, that's where we are right now. Now, in order to do the work plan, we have to figure out where we're headed. And when Mr. Blocker asked me to do this today, I went ahead and, and did some uh, analysis, further analysis on the first report this morning. 
and I'll give you each of you a copy of this. This kind of tells you kind of where we are this year compared to where we were at the same time last year. Well, you can't forget, Mr. Dixon, I want to make a correction of something I said at the last board meeting. I had thought I read, I'm not sure I never went back and reread the article, um, that uh, seven members was reporting that they had 400 pre-K students. I found out today they actually have 400 total students in the entire school. And they have three pre-K classes. So that's very different than what I thought I read. I either misread it. I did read the same thing. OK, so there was it was actually reported incorrectly then. I didn't catch that, but yeah, that was shocking. That would be pretty good. Yeah, it was very shocking. And they said they had high. I answered her question. Huh? Well, there were staff members this year, and that I thought I had read that they had 400 pre-K students. And I was, after a while, adding them up in my head, and I'm thinking, gosh, that's equivalent to like five of our elementary schools. Yeah, that's not just so, um, one. You know, as far as one grade level, so um, I was thinking, wow, and they're building, they want to break ground on a new pre-K building, but they only have 400 total students in the whole school, so. Yeah, we we, have that's a lot not, of private schools yeah. in the county, so, you know, if we did, it would be harder for us to calculate this, but we, we, uh, we don't have that many. If you look at this, though, you can kind of see where we are. I mean, the high school numbers are down from last year considerably, uh, but it's interesting that when we when I get to the next part of what I'm going to explain, the state who does our uh, long-term projections, and we typically use their COFT projections in our work plan in lieu of um, trying to do something different. They're they're saying we're going to grow after you know 10 years, things are going to pick up quite a bit. But things are going to be pretty flat for about five years, and they're going to start going up slowly, and then they're going to go up. So who knows? I mean, they use like a a mathematical model. You know, they do a number of models. And they have a Ouija board, do they? They plot it all out. It's like a witchcraft, you know. But it's, it's always wrong. And then they have to bet, they have to make some assumptions when they choose which model they're going to rely on based on what they think is going to happen. So anything is a general rule. Any projection, the farther out you go, the more nebulous it is. I mean, you can predict pretty well what's going to happen next year, but every year after that it gets a little bit more difficult, like at an exponential rate, to really figure out what might happen unless you really know something's going to happen, like a major event that's going to impact your county uh, enrollment. But if you look at this, you can kind of get a feel for where we are. <clears throat> In the right after the two black lines, you'll see the enrolled as of 9, 10, 12. Uh, that's uh, a year ago. And enrolled as of 9, 9, 13. And then the next column in blue are the numbers, the difference. So we've got six more kids in Central Ridge Elementary and pre K this year than we had last year on the same day, at the same time. But the overall school is down seven students. And then and you'll, you can go through the whole list and you can kind of see where we are. But in summary, the elementaries are down 49 students, about 1%. The middle schools are down 39 students, about 1%. And the high schools are down 211 students, or about 5%. The most shocking thing to me is when we looked at Lacanto High School, when we looked at the staffing plan, we kept saying that I think the numbers are wrong because it matched citrus um, and they're the same number here they are again so um, that was a loss of about 150 students that um, well part, part, part of that was that you rezoned Lacanto right but to, I thought it was only like less than 100 that we rezoned well actually we did run those numbers today to figure out how many of them actually went to Crystal River High School and it's a total of 91 who were at Lacanto or zoned for Lacanto last year who were actually enrolled at Crystal River this year. And then there's some others that are going to different schools for different reasons, but that impact is about 90 to 100 students. Chuck, is that ones that were at Lacanto and went to Crystal River? Or does that include, because I'm wondering if that includes like the new freshman class or if that it would includes have included the freshman too. Okay. So it would have included the students who had, who would have who been would have, going, who would have been going to. And I have the numbers for the grade level too, if you want to look at it. But I only have one copy of it. But. And Chuck, one of the things that I think always, and I'm saying this not as much for the rest of the board members as much as I am for the general public, is while numbers at times look down, 
uh, you know, I mean, like as you're going here and you see these numbers and there's a 1% or one, you know, one or two students down. When you look at our capacity to handle those number of students, we have to look at those compartment, compartmentally, I'm sorry, where we, ha we have to look at them separately. Elementary is one group. And where middle school we have had capacity for a while throughout our district, um, elementary, as we know, has been really the challenge because at the high school level, I think we've talked about there could be some strategic changes right. and that's um, in that those campuses. But the elementary becomes a little more challenging to do that over a long-term basis, which is, I think, was behind the idea of your recommendation to purchase the property in Pine Ridge. Right, and, and, it, and we, we also, in Floral City as well, because yes. basically what you have is two options. You have you could have options depending on what really happens. I mean, if something happens in Floral City or Inverness grows faster than the center part of the county, you have an option there. Or if Crystal River grows faster or, or the Central Ridge grows faster, you have an option there. So which I think it's probably going to be the Central Ridge that needs attention first if, it, if you need to you if you have a lot of growth you have two options and I think it's important not to put all your eggs in one basket and one of my concerns always is because we always have this conversation that comes up and I know that there's a study going on is how we're going to fund those schools because it's a lot easier for us to reduce staff um, to accommodate less students it is much more challenging as I have been a parent in the school systems when we have been busting at the seams and we would literally joke that at Citrus Springs Elementary prior to the opening of Central Ridge, we you know, would go into a closet and go, yeah, we could fit about four students in here in a classroom. And, and literally, I mean, it was the stage was a classroom. And, and I will tell you, as a parent, they did a phenomenal job but I couldn't be any happier when those doors opened to Central Ridge and, uh, and we had a, a more balanced environment for our students. But it took a tremendous amount of time to build up that capital to be able to expend that because I'm, while I was not on this board, I am very proud and pleased as a board member now to not have debt service. Thank you, Mr. Blocker and, and board members for working that we don't have the debt service that other districts have because we have made sure there was funding there before we built those capital improvements. Well, we need to get the funding. And that's really my point, yeah. is that goes back to impact fees. Have they typically been the mechanism for this school board to be able to collect a tremendous amount of funds so that the Aguilorn taxpayer did not bear that burden. I agree. I think that impact fees play a part. I mean, it, it, you need to have a balanced approach to revenue. Absolutely. And every impact fee consultant that we've ever used has said that impact fees shouldn't play, pay the, be expected to pay for the whole project, but a portion of it. And uh, you know, it does. The state has consistently shifted that responsibility down to the local level. So you know, the state money is not no longer available. So you only have a handful of options. Impact fees being one of them. So I wouldn't. Uh, so it's impact fees, though. If we have to, as we look at ten years, and what I know, because I have again been in this community and been a parent in here when I wasn't a board member, this changes overnight. I mean, you you had went from a very stable growth. To an enormous growth in a very short period of time. Um, yes, we've seen it do the opposite, but I do believe that that 10 years could very easily become five years, and we don't have the resources built up to accommodate that right now. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned because that will affect the Aguilar taxpayer, whether that be in a whole amount or whether that be in a millage rate amount, in order to accommodate that. The other issue that I would say is that um, we have we have got to recognize too. Um, there was an article that Mr. Lee, <coughs> who is the president now of the Florida Home Builders Association, and he was a local home builder here, 
I totally value that when he says that the home building market was essential to jobs. We know that. Citrus County recognizes that. It's a balance that we have to, though, find in when we have what we have here. We're at 90% capacity in our elementary school, 89% um, capacity is, I believe, what you have here. And for us, um, you know, that creates some real challenges because it doesn't take a whole lot of elementary school students to push us into <coughs> having to be into a building phase. Right, and that, that brings me kind of to the final point is how we prepared the work plan in terms of the projected growth. And this is the part of Florida Department of Education's uh, segue. Yeah, long term capital uh, COFTE, which is weighted. It's not enrollment, it's a weighted number, but it's what's in the work plan. And we take these numbers basically and apply them to our district based on where we think the growth is going to occur. And, and that's based on historical trends. So if you look at this, you can see these are the numbers that are in the work plan, except for the 20-year number. And in order to get that, I use the uh, University of Florida's business and economic research projections for total population and kind of extrapolate a lot of stuff from that and, and try to figure out how that would fit into the different grade levels. But basically, in the work plan, you're showing a new <coughs> elementary school in 10 years, and two elementary schools, and the Floral City expansion in 20 years. So there's no growth projected per se in the high schools or the middle schools. It's all in the elementary schools. So that's what the projections are. Now that that'll change going forward. You know, in a year or two, you'll probably see some. <coughs> something different, but that's that's what it is right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, these figures are also available to the uh, county commissioners that they plan for business and stuff. Yes, I pull these off the website, off the Florida Department of Education <laughs> facilities website. And they have historical numbers and projections and current numbers. Yes, and that's the main thing people want when they move into a new community is they want to know what the school system is and they want a sewer plant. <laughs> We're giving them both. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon, right before you go, um, something that has been um, not always understood has been what happens after we approve the budget and we approve uh, the, the work plan because it has been alleged at times that that information does not go and get to the Board of County Commissioners. We have had this conversation. Um, I, I would ask that you do two things. One, tell us what has happened and what has been your practice and if you tell us then what will be the practice again. We always send it to the city of Crystal River, the city of Inverness, and the Board of County Commissioners. And we, uh, I have copies of all the uh, email records. I send them a the <coughs> copy and a hard copy. And have you been doing that since you've been in your position? How long have you been in your position? Five or six years. Is it a summary a really good question. Is it a summary account or just a list of figures? No, it's the whole work plan. We just say to them, okay, we have a lot of growth in elementary. Instead of just saying, give them a list of figures that shows growth in elementary, it's good to have um, a summary of what is coming rather than just the tabulations. Sometimes people don't want to sit there and look at all the tabulations, but they certainly don't really care about the summary. They don't get the tabulations. Well, we, we also meet with them every few months. We have a meeting, we have a long range planning committee. They have a representative on there, so do the cities. And, we share that information back and forth. Plus, I'm your representative on the planning planning commission, so we see what's <coughs> going on in the county. And if there's ever a question or anything, we always tell them what we think, you know, and and explain where our facilities are if there's a question along those lines. So they're they're aware of our situation, especially with the sewer plan, the things like projects like that we coordinate with. Yeah, it's really. And again, when we did the um, the road in front of the new property, the lighted uh, intersection for 
491, uh, 46, I'm sorry, uh, for the new property. That was another coordinated effort. We did there's no local agreement on that. And was any of that impact fee funded? Yes, that is. Um, the one in Crystal River High School on Turkey Oak was not impact fee funded because right. that's not an expansion project, but for any new facility, it's fundable with impact fees. And had they not used that, that would have again had to come out of what funding source typically? That would come out of gas tax for, for transportation. If the county paid for that for their own uh, use, uh, but they wouldn't have had to put in turn lanes, but any, any road improvements would, would uh, our impact fees, transportation impact fees possibly could have paid for part of that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, educational services, Mr. Clotter. Need to approve the maximum <laughs> risk residential juvenile justice. Mm. This is an agreement that we have with the G4S Youth Services, and I have uh, Mrs. Nobles is our district contact with Cypress Creek, and uh, Principal Rob Cummins is here to answer questions. Uh, G4S has served for several years as our contractor for educational services at Cypress Creek. Just as a reminder to you that um, Cypress Creek is a level 10 high risk facility with that is operated um, for the Department of Juvenile Justice in Lakanto um, for up to 96 young men. Um, Rob, do you have specific questions that you'd like to ask us or? Uh, you have to say. I did. I uh, pulled this and had some questions I wanted to ask you. Um, on the on page two, it's talking about the provider agrees. It talked about an M, the initial diagnostic and evaluation services for exceptional students. And I, I know in the school system how that occurs. You know, it's very very clear. But I did not know at Cypress Creek how that occurred because it's you know, level ten. Okay. What um, or how does it work? Sure. Basically, um, we have ESC certified teachers. Five out of our seven are ESC certified. Um, the other two have temporary certificates. Um, they're working towards certification. G4S mandates that all of our teachers become ESC certified um, because we have such a very high population of ESC students, probably about 50%. Um, G4S offers. Uh, reimbursement for, for that certification. So they'll defray the costs, they'll send us, uh, send the teachers to training, they'll take the subject area exam for ESE to get the certification and they'll reimburse them. And they will allow them to take that exam as many times as possible until they actually pass it. So if it takes a, a teacher two or three tries at it and they have to go to specific trainings for it, G4S will pay for it. Um, we work with the school district Paul Hines, who is the uh, ESC specialist, comes in. He does the matrix for G4 for, uh, for the ESC students. He makes the determination whether or not they're eligible. He makes the determination whether they're a 251 or a 252 student, and then we go from there with it. As far as the uh, you know the IEP goals, we follow the IEP as set forth. Most of the students that come in already have an ESC designation. So it's just uh, making sure that the matrix is up to date, and then we move forward with the services from there. <coughs> no, he's not. Now we also we also have some kids that require uh, speech <coughs> therapy through their IEP. We have speech ther therapists come in. I think it's Superior Therapies. I think that's the name of it that comes in, and they do that. We have some students that get that service twice a week, um, and probably about ten that get it once a week. So Paul does the evaluation, because uh, you don't have a testing like in uh, the ESE program, you have psychologists come to test everybody. You know, so we, used to have, we used to have the, the school psychologists come in, but they, they made that determination over a period of time that that part of it's not necessary. Every now and then there's a student where it becomes necessary, and we offer that. Um, I can't remember the, the lady that used to come in, but she used to come in quite, quite often. We haven't probably had somebody that come in and done a test like that in about a year and a half. Nancy, that, that um, is okay with, with federal rules and stuff? Or, uh, We're not talking about initial eligibility. We're talking about students who've already been identified well, and already no, have a full evaluation. 
and when he said that Paul comes in and determines, it's still a committee decision with an IEP team. It's not just Paul making that decision. And how about initial eligibility? Is that the psychologist? Who? It depends on which eligibility, which program that would be for. But as far as I'm aware of, we have not identified any new students. We do have a child find obligation if there's a student that they have concerns about that's not an ESE student, and we would make arrangements for a school psychologist to, to be a part of that team should it be needed. But primarily what we find is the students have come from somewhere else. They already have an IEP. They already have services designated. We know what they're eligible for, and they just arrange the services. So essentially, they're following the same rules they would if they were in absolute high school. That I was wondering about it, so I wanted some clarification. Okay, thank you. And then another question on progress monitoring plans for non ESE students. And uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. I mean, if you know, so I'm asking if you could explain that to me. Basically, any student that's a level one or two student has some type of a progress monitoring plan. And for most of the students who come to Cypress Creek, they are monitored mainly from the aspect of credits so that we can make sure that by the time that they leave the facility, they're well on their way to either a diploma or they earn a GED. And in some cases, we have students who uh, complete their high school education and even are enrolled uh, as dual enrollment students uh, with colleges. So again, it's not going to be on the same rules that they would follow if they were in high school. Okay. Right. When, when the students come in, we, we evaluate and we, um, um, we review all their transcripts, review all their previous test scores or FCAT scores. We also um, administer what's called a common assessment, which DJJ requires. Basically what that test does is it measures gains or losses in, in reading and math from when they come to the facility and at the time of exit. We also fare test. Um, we also give the BOSI test, which, which is a test that actually gives us uh, some data that we can use to, to determine um, what area, subject areas they're strong or weak in. Um, the common assessment really doesn't give any diagnostic uh, information. It just gives you a raw score that nobody really understands what it means, but it measures gains and losses. So, but to do the progress monitoring part, um, what we do is we have what's called a uh, formal and informal treatment team. The formal treatment team is where the education department um, really gets into it, and, and it's a monthly evaluation where we go over each student's IAP or IEP. We uh, we look at their goals, we see if they're progressing towards those goals. If some of the kids have met those goals, we, we make an adjustment. And what we do at the treatment team is uh, we then get with that student, a whole group of people from every department, um, we get on the phone with their uh, probation officers if they have any, with their school district that they're coming from, um, with their parents, and then we discuss all those things. And that's where the progress monitoring is done. It's a complete uh, monthly grade evaluation and not only just the grade but all aspects of the classroom such as behavior and, <coughs> and things of that, that nature so that's how we, we uh, monitor the progress and that, that's what it sounds like as i read through it was like, uh, as if it was this high school but i don't want to be sure it's actually what about the general education diploma how many students seem to go in that direction okay well we do not we do not enroll students in a GED program. Every student is enrolled in a credit-based program to earn a high school diploma. Now that doesn't mean that that's the track that they automatically stay on. Believe it or not, there's still some circuit court judges in the state of Florida that order that students take and pass the GED before they, they leave the facility. Um, so those students, regardless of how well they, they test it out on the, on the practice GED, we still have to offer that. What we do is we evaluate each student based on their age, what their credits are at the time of exit, or what their credits are going to be at the time of exit, um, and what the likelihood is of them returning to a public school. Now, if they're ESE students, there, there's more, more play and more leeway with that because they can stay in, in public school longer. Some of their charges mandate and necessitate that they're not going to be allowed to go back into the public school system. Those kids, we give the GED to. Um, we had 10 kids pass the GED. We've got about a 58% pass rate, which is the, which is completed every section and earned their GED 58%. We probably have about a close to an 
asterisk if you broke it down into subject area. But we gave out 10 GED diplomas and 18 regular high school diplomas last year. Well, and now with the GED, we're the first DJJ facility now that actually gives the GED on the computer. I know that uh, at WTI, they were the pilot program for, for public school system, and, and we're the pilot program for DJJ, and we gave our first six tests last month, half the kids passed it. So now it's going to be more of a situation where we can test these kids more so on an as-needed basis, actually individually. So we don't have to wait until we get a group of seven, eight, or nine students to test them. We can, we'll actually be able to test the student once they get within their last 100 days of the program, and then if necessary, test them um, each month on the, on the portions that they, they didn't pass. Yes, we have a complete, total transition program uh, with a transition specialist. Um, we monitor the, the students up to a four-month period. We monitor them. Um, and then DJJ, I think, does some monitoring after that. When you talk about recidivism rates and, and, and re-offend rates and things like that, um, it's hard to understand sometimes what they consider a success story and what they don't. And I think the parameters are four months. So after four months, we're to review that transition plan to see if the student has followed the plans that were set forth and given to them when they leave, which is really spelled out to them. It's like in chronological order in language that they can understand. You need to do this the first day, this the second day, this the third day, right down the line, and we monitor that up to, up to four months. And we have a complete transition team that does that. It works pretty well, and I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you that we, you know, the, the kids don't reoffend because they do. It is, it is a level 10 maximum risk facility. There's some really, really uh, bad crimes that were committed for these kids to be there, and and, um, but for the most part, when you're talking about the education aspect of it, there's a clear difference, and, and it's measurable for the kids that earn these GEDs and high school diplomas. Their recidivism rate is. Like it's 180 compared to the kids that don't. So you're looking at a, a you know 65 percent reoffend rate for kids that don't have that finish that education compared to about 30 that do. What when, when did you go from level six to level ten? Um, we were level eight, level ten, and you were level six? well, not since I've been there. Okay. Um, and we went from level eight to level ten solely probably about a year ago, okay. and and the minimum that a kid can stay at Cypress Creek is 18 months. That's the minimum. Because, of, because what they figure is, is Cypress Creek is not a, it's not a time-based facility, it's a program-based facility. And the minimum that a student can, can uh, complete that program is 18 months, providing they do everything they're supposed to do from day one into the program. Probably the average stay is about 25 to 26 months. But if you're in level 10, you have some most murderers. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so you got murderers and everything else below that. Is, are any of these students then going on to an adult uh, jail facility directly from you? Some. There are some that uh, um, that are there that are going to be held there because of because of age, because of size, um, until their 18th or 19th birthday, and then they they have DOC sentences. Um, there are a few of those. Coach, um, I've had the pleasure of spending some time there, and uh, I, I know that G4S has tried to make it a model facility to really show other juvenile facilities what, how they can run. It always impresses me how much learning is going on there. Um, one of the programs that you all developed, uh, I just can't say enough about, but I really think that this board needs to, to just hear a couple sentences on it, and that is um, the team of one, and how that is helping those students while they're there to be effective people and young people, and subsequently I think it's made a difference in the graduation rate among those students. I think the big thing, um, the most important thing to understand about the kids uh, that are at Cypress Creek is 
we house 96 of them. And on any given day, but probably 95 of them have never done anything for anybody else in their life other than themselves. Complete total selfishness, their, their wants and needs came first before anything else. What has happened with the team of one is it's, it's taught these kids to first off respect themselves, respect authority, respect others around them, respect other people's property, and to give back and to help each other. Most of these kids have never helped anybody do anything. So what they do is they, they partner up. They get a group of about six, eight, ten kids. They're mentored um, by other uh, adults in the facility, not just education department people, but safety and security people, case managers, mental health workers. And they basically teach these boys life skills. And you'd be surprised at the amount of 16-year-old children in that facility that have two or three children already. And yet they're, they're not acting at, at all responsible or anything like an adult because they come from an environment where that never existed to them. So they're basically taught how to do things the right way. They're taught that there's an option to doing things other than taking. There's other ways of doing it. You'd be surprised how many kids think it's normal to go into your house and take what you have because they want it or need it. And they don't think there's anything wrong with that. And even though we know that it's right from wrong, they've grown up their whole life thinking that that's the normal way of doing it. And a lot of that stemmed from because that's what their parents did. And it's just, a, they just come from a bad environment. So they learn that. Um, it works out quite well for the kids that graduate. Some of them don't make it. It's tough to stay in that program. They don't, they don't toe the line and do what they're supposed to do and be role models for the other students there at Cypress Creek. They get kicked out and maybe they'll get another shot at it somewhere down the road. But it's, it's, it's a tough program that needs to be tough. And I will tell you, going to the Team of One graduation and seeing some of those kids that are in a shirt and tie for the very first time in their life, <coughs> um, and they are walking in tall because they've made it through that program. And they, have, they give back after that program, if I recall. They become then the mentors for the next group of young people. I think we've had, um, I think we're in our third class right now. That's great. Thank you, Coach. OK, do we have a motion? Um, I just uh, another question. You, I think you probably answered it. How many years have we had an agreement with the G46 organization? It's uh, G4S, and I'm not 100% sure. I know that we've had an agreement um, for the six years I've been there. And I think it's longer than that. It is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite any of you who would like to go to Cypress Creek. If you want to go with someone, I'll be glad to take you and and let you see the facility and, and we'll meet with Rob and see it. So. What are we having for dinner next week? Yeah, serve a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we have, next do we have a motion? I move to approve the National Risk Residential Juvenile Justice Program to the G4S. Services LLC in the school board of Cedars County for 13 school year. Second. A motion by Ms. Powers and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Do we have any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We've got a 5.30 hearing that we need to go to now, so I need to recess the regular meeting. No, not recess? What am I doing? And I'm opening up the public hearing on the final budget. I need to call the meeting to order. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to adopt the final millage rate for the five-year work plan and the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-14 fiscal year. Millage rates are 5.813 for operating purposes and 1.500 for capital outlay purposes, or a total of 7.313 mills. The final budget for fiscal year 2013-2014 totals 222,159,115 million is there anyone here who wishes to address the board as to the millage levy, 
the five-year work plan, or the budget proposed for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Are you wanting to talk about your taxes? Yes. I just want to know. Honey, come up to okay. the, the podium. Okay. And you will have three minutes. Three? Oh, Lord, I got to face. State your, uh, <laughs> state your name. Lily L. Horton. I'm the owner of the land 208 East Denver. Mm -hmm. And my house burnt down in 92. And I was only paying $200 a year for that land, for taxes. About five years ago, they jumped up 1500 For what? The land didn't get no bigger. It didn't get no smaller. Uh, Ms. Horton, I think you're at the wrong hearing. I think you need to be that's a that's Board of County I Commissioners. I had the wrong cause. All I want to do is set it and get it out of my hands because every year <laughs> the tax is going up and up and up. Last year I paid 947 This year they got $1,017. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, the, there's a meeting being held right now at the Board of County Commissioners, and that's really where you can get some help. Where at? At the new courthouse. I was just there, and they sent me here. They lied to you, honey. The, the oh, sheriff, no. the, the man that the, one of the police told me to come to this one. Hey, wait, have you had any help with the I just left the courthouse. Mm. All right. I got to call my daughter to come pick me up again. Continue with whatever you want to say. We're willing to no, but I really want this, the county or the city, whoever wants it, I want to set it. But I'm not going to keep going up and up and up on that land because I don't work. I get one check, disability, mm -hmm. and they just give just enough to skid by your teeth to live off one month. And you're no longer living on the land. Uh, so I'm not living on the land, but I, I can't, I'm going to just go pull a thousand dollars off a tree. So what I what you probably had a homestead tax exemption? No, okay. not on that land downtown. That I'm paying for that for just land, nothing on it but grass. <laughs> I want to sell it, but they don't want to pay. But they need to pay me for it. If another lady on the other end got ninety-seven thousand and my land bigger than hers, I should get some money too. I would suggest that you do talk to the property appraiser, and just because when they initially send those notices out. It's our yeah, right here. I, would, I, would, I would definitely encourage you to talk to the property appraiser on that just for clarification. Oh, I put in that into the taxpayer. They want to buy it, but they don't want to pay. But I dig up some money before they take it from me. Well, we have a value adjustment Thank board. Thank you, ma'am. Huh? A value adjustment board that you can complain to. What, about, what is that? It's called the value adjustment board, and it's down at the courthouse. You now. The courthouse? No, it's not now. No. Well, when it'll be? Uh, it meets. Quarterly, quarterly, and then the next one's in December. But you have to start the process with what? the property appraiser's okay, office. Okay, what should I do now to be ready for December? Well, go to the property appraiser's okay. office and just sit down and talk with an agent there and explain your situation, and then they will guide you with the next steps as far as you you have the right as a taxpayer to yeah, dispute told you, yeah. that. So okay. start with the property appraiser's office, Jeff Green's okay, office. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm thank you. Wrong. Thank you for it's coming. not a problem. Thank you very much for coming okay, in. Okay, thank you. She had dinner? Is there anybody else that wishes to address the board as to the millage levy, the five-year work plan, or the budget proposed for the 2013-2014 fiscal year? Anyone else? Is there a motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0.748 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.50 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law? I make a move to include the supplemental millage rate of 0.748 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.5 mills and the resolution determining revenues and millage levy as required by law. I second. 
Ms. Balfour moved and Ms. Powers seconded the motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0.748 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.50 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law. Is there any discussion on the motion? Resolution of the District School Board of Citrus County, Florida, determining the amount of revenues to be to be produced and the millage to be levied for the general fund for the district local capital improvement fund and for district debt services funds for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2013 and ending June 30, 2014. Whereas Section 1011.04 Florida Statutes requires that upon receipt of the certificate of the property appraiser giving the assessed valuation of the county and of each of the special tax school districts, the school board shall determine by resolution the amounts necessary to be raised for current operating purposes and for debt service funds and the millage to be levied for each such fund, including the voted millage and Whereas Section 1011.71 Florida Statutes provides for the amounts necessary to be raised for local capital improvement outlay and the millage to be levied and whereas the certificate of the property appraiser has been received, therefore be it resolved by the District School Board that the amounts necessary to be raised as shown by the officially adopted budget and the millages necessary to be levied for each school fund for the district for the fiscal year are as follows. Certified taxable value ten billion eight hundred seventy three million nine hundred thirty three thousand three two excuse me two hundred thirty five dollars. Description of levy required local effort amount to be raised fifty two million eight hundred seventy three thousand four hundred thirteen dollars. Millage levy five point zero six five zero mills. Prior prior period funding adjustment millage zero total required millage. Amount to be raised $52,873,413. Millage levy 5.0650 mills. Number two, district school tax discretionary millage, non voted levy. Certified taxable value $10,873,933,235. Description of levy, discretionary operating. Amount to be raised seven million eight hundred eight thousand three hundred fifty four dollars. Millage levy zero point seven four eight zero mills. Number three, district school tax additional millage voted levy. Certified taxable value zero description of levy additional operating amount raised zero millage levy zero. Number four, district local capital improvement tax non voted levy. Certified Taxable value ten billion eight hundred seventy three million nine hundred thirty three thousand two hundred thirty five dollars. Description of levy, local capital improvement. Amount to be raised fifteen million six hundred fifty eight thousand four hundred sixty four dollars. Millage levy one point five zero 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 mills. Number five, district debt service tax voted levy. Certified taxable value zero, description of levy zero, amount to be raised zero, millage levy zero. Number six, the total millage rate to be levied is less than the rollback rate computed pursuant to section 200.065 print one close print by Florida statute comma by 1.18 percent. Having heard the resolution and there is a motion on the floor, is there any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion passes five to zero. Is there a motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year? Second. Ms. Powers moved and Mr. Kennedy seconded the motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board <coughs> for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt All those in favor of the motion. 
motion to adopt. Oh, it's on there. <coughs> it's on the, final the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Is there a motion to adopt the <coughs> final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year? I move to adopt the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal school year. Mr. Kennedy moved and Ms. Dorchman seconded the motion to adopt the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the final budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. A resolution of the Citrus County School Board adopting the final budget for fiscal year 2013-2014. Whereas the School Board of Citrus County, Florida did, pursuant to chapters 200 and 1011 Florida statutes, approve final millage rates, comma, um, final five-year work plan, and a final budget for the fiscal year July 1, 2013 to June 30, 2014. And Whereas the school board of Citrus County set forth the appropriations and revenue estimates for the budget for fiscal year 2013-2014 and whereas at the public hearing and in full compliance with chapter 200 Florida statutes, the school board of Citrus County adopted the final millage rates on the final five-year work plan and the final budget in the amount of $222,159,115 for fiscal year 2013-2014. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the attached budget of the School Board of Citrus County, including the millage rates as set forth therein, is hereby adopted by the School Board of Citrus County as the final budget for the categories indicated for fiscal year July 1, 2013 to June 30, 2014. Is there a motion to approve the resolution adopting the final budget? I move to approve the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Second a motion. Ms. Deutschman moved. Ms. Powers seconded the motion to adopt the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the resolution adopting the fiscal budget of the Cit final budget, thank you, of the Citrus County School Board for the 2013-2014 fiscal year, say aye. 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 Whew. It is a tough read. We will adjourn the public hearing. And wait, 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 wait. Do you have a, uh, I'm sorry, there's some other stuff on there. Yes. Public hearing? Yes. Policies. Oh, that's right. Reopen the public hearing. We'll reopen. These are all food service related public hearings. Okay. Policy changes. Uh, Mr. Pistoni's here too if you have any questions that I can't answer. Uh, the first one is policy 8.41, a request to approve revisions. Uh, basically, it's a citation change, a deletion of an old citation, and the Change to Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I think we have to have a. Do we, do we need a individual motions to approve? Okay. So, yes, ma'am. Do you have any public input? Is there any public input? Is there any public input? Seeing none? Move to approve policy 8.41. Right now, second that policy to approve 8.41 meal patterns. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. The next. Uh, 
public hearing is a request to approve the revision of policy 8.42 regarding free and reduced price meals and meal prices. Uh, this one you did have some discussion on at the workshop and the language is on page one of two. The uh, citation change is noted on page two of two and the change to Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Do you have any additional questions? Is there any public input? Is there any public input? Is there any public input? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I move approval uh, to revisions to policy 8.42, free and reduce meal uh, price meals. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Deutschman. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. The next one, item D, is a request to approve revision of policy 8.43 regarding competitive sale regulations. Uh, this is uh, just a change in citation to the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Do we have any public input? Is there any public input? Any uh, any public input? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve policy 8.43 competitive sales regulations. We have a motion by Ms. Balfour. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion by Ms. Balfour and a second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Item E is a request to approve revision of policy 8.44 school food service funds. Um, basically, policy revises section 5, deletes citations 1006.06 Florida statutes and 6A 7.041 Florida Administrative Code, adds citations 570.981 Florida statutes and 5P-1.003 Florida Administrative Code. Do we have any public input? Is there any public input? Any public input? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I approval of the revision policy 8.44 We have a motion by Ms. Storchman and a second by Ms. Powers. Do we have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. And the final public hearing for policy changes is item F, request to approve the revision of policy 8.45 <clears throat> school breakfast program. This is basically striking the, the part under section five that says beginning with the 2010-11 school year because that's no longer necessary and keeping the rest of that section and then the change to adds uh, Florida statute 570.981, delete the statutes that have been superseded and change it to the citation to Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and the related administrative code citations. Is there any public input? Is there any public input? Any public input? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I make a motion to request for the approval of the revision to policy 8.45 as stated Second. We have a motion by Ms. Balfour and a second by Mr. Kennedy. Do we have any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Now can I close this? <laughs> I'll now close the public hearing and we will reconvene the regular meeting. I can figure out where we are. Okay. Yeah, I'm there. Um, we need to approve the Department of Education 2013-14 IDEA Entitlement Grant. I'll move approval of the 2013-2014 uh, IDEA Entitlement Grant. A second. We have a motion by Ms. Deutschman and a second by Ms. Balfour. Do we have any questions or comments? Is there any changes from the previous years? Mrs. Haynes is here to answer questions. Hi, Ms. Haynes. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Good. 
Um, there are some changes. We reduced some of our staff numbers, um, but it's clearly reflected in the application you have in front of you. I have a question about uh, services to the private and homeschool programs. Uh, I know the private school that's usually done at the time. Somebody asked me if they're doing a homeschool, if the child's in homeschool, are they provided with the services that, that would be provided with the public school? Yes, they are. In Citrus County, we still feel it's necessary for us to fulfill the child find obligation if a parent has chosen to homeschool the student and they're not identified as a child with a disability, then we go through the response to intervention process at the school the student is zoned to attend and determine whether or not that child has a disability. Many of the students that will be in our schools and then the parent will make the decision to homeschool them and they may already have an IEP, and we will sit down and meet as an IEP committee, and that team will make the decision as what services that parent desires for that child. And what kind of time is involved in it? If the child needs services, it could be like five hours a day, would that occur, or is it? It would really vary, Ms. Powers, depending on the needs of a student. I can remember a child from about three years ago who was homeschooled part day and receiving SLD services, um, in reading and math, I believe, at Floral City Elementary School. Um, it's it's a real mix. Many times they might just only come in for speech language services. You they know. come in, but I, I was asking about the teacher going to the house. Is that her? We do not send a teacher to the home if they're homeschooled. If they're home, hospital homebound, then we would. Sometimes we have homeschooled that teacher going to the house, so we don't do that. The child goes to Correct. We may have students who, because of disciplinary action, are home placed. It gets a little confusing. Homeschool, homebound, home placed. Um, if a student has been placed home placed because of disciplinary action, then we have a responsibility to provide those services that that child has on their IEP. So that may be why you're thinking that someone would go to the home to work with a student or meet at the library. Well, Homeschool student would get the same services as that child. The same child would get in a school, uh, and with the teacher going to the home. And no. that didn't seem to be. No, we don't have that obligation. Uh, okay, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. What if a uh, child has a physical <coughs> disability that you mentioned and would need um, some services that would be provided? I would say the child, uh, oh, I don't know, had an injury, uh, run over by a car or something, and it, uh, be at school, would it be a full range of services with math, science, social studies, all that? Or would it we have an obligation to provide them with access to the general education curriculum, and if they're a high school student, we would have to provide all the credits that they need towards graduation. We wouldn't go in and do electives. We might have to do some adjustments to their schedule if they had a lab science or something like that. But yes, we've had many children. I mean, we've dramatically reduced our services to hospital homebound children over the last three or four years because we've developed relationships with the doctors where they have a clearer understanding of what our obligation is and what it truly means to be hospital homebound. But if that service is, is determined to be a need to a student, they wouldn't necessarily get related services like OT or PT through the school district but they would get everything that's on their IEP, their free and appropriate public education. So the time frame the teacher would then have to go to the home, the time frame is very important to what? Very much so. Does. It wouldn't be five hours a day to a student who wouldn't have the endurance to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and there may be an average, and I could get that information for you. I'm not really sure if there is, because every decision is made by that. And, and some of the children who are on hospital homebound were not ESE students with an IEP until they were injured. But that service is provided as an IEP designated service. So we bring that team together. If the other child was in say uh, elementary school receiving services for six hours a day, you could then rewrite the IEP if the child that was injured and would only need two hours a day or could only stand two hours a day. You, you would not uh, negate any federal uh, law by doing that if you change that <coughs> because of the you know, and because it's it's the IEP team that determines that. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Haynes and, and um, I agree with you and I'm glad that our district takes the position it does when it comes to our SLD and our IEDA um, 
IDEA uh, students. That said, um, a home student, um, and Mr. Walker, you can chime in on this. Would we, once we determine that they need services, are we going to receive funding for that um, in addition to the home, uh, the home school, because the home school is going to get that funding? When the student comes on campus for a service, they would be registered as a student at that school for that time, and that would be reflected in that student's schedule. So if a student came for speech language services twice a week for half an hour, then that student schedule would just be those two half hour periods and that would be then counted in our FTE count. So we do get that, that time then on that, excellent. I wasn't aware of that, I thought we, uh, we were having to do that. Testing services, we don't get reimbursed for, Mr. Blocker, is that right. correct? That's good to know, thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anything else? I don't think so, I think you did a good job, thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. We've got uh, citizens comments. For those of you that have filled out a green card and haven't come forward to speak, um, you'll have three minutes. Mr. Heron. Again, my name is Quentin Heron, and if it pleases the board, uh, my right cocktail lens is giving me fists. So if anything I've been winking at during the last hour or so, I apologize, it's really not real nice, okay? Um, the state of Florida has enacted laws that are generic to all school districts, but the state has also granted schools the right to establish rules and policies within the law that can apply to their individual schools, such as our own code of student conduct. This policy handbook has not changed significantly in over a decade, but technology and social behavior has changed significantly. For example, cell phone usage with the texting and sexting and inappropriate photos, etc. Because of these changes, this handbook is ambiguous, contradictory, and uh, incomplete, and with the exception of some felonious violations, uh, unenforceable. Uh, <clears throat> the handbook is saturated with the words may, should, uh, too many to even begin the list. To set the foundation for my proposal, I want to set two examples concerning the dress code. Referring to page 28 of the handbook, it says, clothing should not be sexually suggestive. Clothing should cover all undergarments. Head covers and hats should not be worn. And on page 29, a student violating the dress code may be sent home to change clothes, and or a parent or guardian may be asked to bring a change of clothes. I'm just kind of curious, why the aversion to using the word shall? The board has that right. My proposal is this, will the board agree to form a committee, independent committee, to study the practicality and feasibility of establishing a standardized dress code? Now, the term standardized dress code is code not to be confused with uniforms. By having a standardized dress code, it, it uh, shields the board from having to provide clothing for uniforms. I researched this matter in great detail, and if the board agrees to my proposal, the independent committee will have to work in close harmony with the handbook committee to establish uh, the typical parameters and verbiage, all of course, remain within the law. And uh, my question is this, is there any reason why this motion cannot, proposal cannot be put forward now with details be worked out in the near future, say the next two or three weeks? Now, forget my naivete, Mrs. Bryant, but I don't know if I should address you or if I should address the members of the body. How do I do this? You can address me, and um, and we'll take it under advisement. Okay, for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You. I'm, I'm going to. I don't mind, and I'm sure Mr. Bradshaw's may freak out here because anytime we talk back. But, um, <laughs> sir, just so you know, <laughs> every year we no. go through an extensive review, an extensive review. And if you've been here during those workshops and meetings, you will know that we actually go through that book meticulously. We have actually changed that book since I've been on the board, and I've only been on the board three years. We've made extensive changes, in particular to electronics, use of uh, digital and mobile devices. We've actually rewritten the entire section with regard to that. In addition, there was legislation passed specific to students' dress that we had to put in by law just two years ago. In fact, the state made us change the code in the middle of it. So. I would really encourage you 
to when we have those meetings and when we do, we have a committee, there's a board representative from the committee. We then go out to the SACs, to the school advisor enhancement councils. We get input from them, from the parents, from the teachers, and all of that gets feedback to that committee. Then we review it. And then each one of us gives input prior to that meeting, and then we workshop that meeting. It takes months, and we do that every year. Now, I will tell you that may and should, Florida legislation allows, and statute allows, great, great amount of feasibility and discretion to a principal, because their campus needs to be one where they have authority on it. So that's why there are times where there is may and should, because there are times when there needs to be some human common sense applied, and it doesn't uh, put the board into a situation where the board is deciding every dress that a student makes. Because I can't have every example when I'm developing a policy to know what is appropriate in every wear and what isn't. So that's why those other parameters are put in place and I will tell you, having been, again, as you are, a spouse of a, an educator, that it is also, it puts a lot of pressure on the teachers that they have on each of their campuses, where they then have a system where then they report that to their administrator. The administrator reviews that. In some cases, student services is then com is called to get verification and understanding and clarification. That sometimes has gone all the way up to our board attorney. So I would take exception to say that that book has never been changed or that is minorly changed or that it has been unsignificantly changed because that was the implication. And I would say that that's really just not the case. Come to us during those times. Look at what we're discussing because I will tell you, even the words the and 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 commas have made big impacts during those conversations. Okay, well I would refer you to the 2002-2003 handbook compared to the 2012-13 handbook. And uh, uh, let's talk about your, your remarks here. I had occasion to go to the student services to pick up this handbook. While there, okay, I was there during a classroom change. I looked up at people walking down the hallway, and two young ladies wearing blue jean shorts with a hem about that far below the crotch seam. Okay? Clothing. Why we the, uh... Sir, I was just going to say, I, I, I think that, that what you're talking about uh -huh. then is, is not a policy issue. That's something that you would need to talk up because that, if someone was dressed in a manner in which you felt was not appropriate, that would be something you would take to their supervisor. It's not a policy matter, it's an administrative matter. Well, your policy is clothing that should not be sexually suggestive. And I'm saying if you felt the policy was not being followed, or you felt that it was unclear, then that would be something I would encourage you to talk to Ms. Hemmel, and you and she can direct you because that staff is one that reports to her and her team. Mr. Kenny, with respect, sir, it is policy. Your policy says that that uh, the, the hem of the shorts and skirt should not be above the fingertips when put down to the side. Okay, so that is policy. That's positive that the handbook has put in you, place. You said, were you saying a student in student services? No, no, I saw students walk in the hallways uh, changing classes. In student services? No, sir. When the student services is, approached, is next to the Cantor High School. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm in the parking lot there. I'm looking at the Guys, we're not going to finish this right now. <clears throat> okay, no, fine. We're not. Just, I apologize, Mr. Bryan, one more time or no. Okay. Not a problem. And just for clarification, is the, yes, sir. the principal is the one who has the right to interpret the dress code. If you have an issue with the interpretation of it, you can go to the principal. Yes, sir, but other, other interstate, interstate uh, school boards here in Florida, they have the word shall in their policies. Dylan Newton. Please state your name, and you'll have three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dylan Newton. I was invited here today by Thomas Kennedy to kind of talk to you a little bit about um, my experiences within Citrus County School Districts. Um, I'm a parent here of two children now. I've been here for nine years. Uh, we entered the school system when my oldest was in kindergarten. She's now a freshman in high school. 
um, and my youngest is now starting kindergarten, so I'm starting all over again. Um, with where we've lived, we've actually been rezoned, so I um, can uh, say that I'm lucky enough to have been through four schools within Citrus County, uh, Forest Ridge, Central Ridge, Crystal River Middle, and Christopher High now. Um, I just wanted to, I guess if I were the board, what would I want to hear? Um, so I wanted to let you know, um, from my perspective, certainly the parent needs to be involved, but um, I worked for years in J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm all about the numbers, and uh, having been here for just a few minutes, I can see that you are too. So I prepared a little bit of numbers for you, so you can feel a little bit better today. Um, so within the four schools in Citrus Counties that we've been to, she has had uh, 45 providers of my child's education, so the teachers are the providers of the education. We've had 45, if you count all the core teachers, plus the, um, the special ed, or the, uh, the, the PE and the art and the special teachers. Um, so of that, uh, I really, I sat down and I thought, well, what would I wanna know as a, as a board member? Uh, there's only about two that I could name to you, and I of course won't, but there's only about two that I could name to you that, would, that I would be able is sort of unstand, you know, sub, substandard. Two out of 45. And if you are uh, a numbers person as I am, that's a very low number, right? So if you think most of my time has been satisfied, and in fact, I went through and I listed all of the teachers that I feel were exemplary. Um, I'm happy to list off their names if you'd like, but of the 45 providers, those 45 teachers that my daughter's nine years here, and I have another one just starting, 12 of them are exemplary, and exemplary in my book um, is quite high. My standards are very, very high for my children and my children's providers, my children's teachers. So 12 out of 45, that's about, no, I'm an English major, not a math major, so my numbers are a little bit off, I'm sorry. That's 25, 27% uh, are exemplary, where the teaching is not just a vocation in my mind, it's a calling. Uh, and only two of the 45, or 4%, I felt were, you know, probably needed to take a look at where they were in the career. But really, if you take a look from a numbers perspective, um, you know, 30% I've been wowed by, 60% satisfied by, and only 4% um, sort of you know, not as impressed by. So that's a 96% customer satisfaction rate from one of your customers <laughs> and children. Um, so uh, when I was in the business world, you always go by the 80-20 rule, so anything above 80% satisfied is always a big, big deal. You know, Jane Powers and all the awards that they give. So I am one of many parents that you have, and I know you probably hear a lot of negative messages or not so happy people because typically the squeaky wheels are what you get. <laughs> so I'm here not to be a squeaky wheel today and tell you about my um, my satisfaction rate with you with your school district. So well done. Thank you very Thank much. <laughs> and my son has the pleasure of also being with um, her daughter in the health academy in the biomed program, which they are having far too much fun while learning. Do something minds. about that, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We need to approve the purchase of additional site licenses for online access to 31 full credits of high school virtual courses from Penn Foster. From what? This too, but from? From what funds? Oh. No, it says on-site licenses to access to 31 full credits. So it, what was it before? Okay. What was it before? Well. We have um, Title VI funds which expire at the end of September. So we are trying to spend the rest of our funds um, for um, site licenses, uh, for students to be able to do Penn Foster. Last year we had, from December onward, we had 47 students who were enrolled in Penn Foster to take 94 credits. Of those 47 students, seven of them have received their Penn Foster diploma. 13 of them are still working on their Penn Foster into um, their fifth year uh, as a high school student. Five students have withdrawn and 22 students um, that were enrolled passed FCAT or received a concordant score um, for ACT. Very good. Thank you. And we attribute some of that success to the Penn Foster program, don't we? Because we see when they get enrolled, either they the take the pressure out. Whatever, yeah. So mm -hmm. what I am asking for is to approve 31 uh, credits additional now, licenses. 31 credits now that we can start our our current seniors in, 
and then when we receive the Title VI funds in October that starts the next part of Title VI, I'll be back um, <laughs> to ask for approval for more credits for our current seniors. Um, over the years, we have kind of moved how we are looking at, so basically the students that we are enrolling in Penn Foster are students that um, if they complete two credits could receive a Pennsylvania diploma. Um, they are students who are basically on target for graduation other than FCAT is holding them back. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand what was just said. <laughs> okay. So with that, my, my big question was how are we measuring the effectiveness of the Penn Foster program compared to other online programs? And I, I just in the, in sure the case of Penn Foster, if a student takes two credits of Penn Foster, that if they go ahead and pass FCAT, then those credits would transfer back into Citrus County Schools and that would be part of their credits. However, if they do not pass um, FCAT, they can transfer then, paper-wise, uh, to Pennsylvania and they can receive a Pennsylvania diploma. Okay. So, so it's not actually competing with other online programs that we have, it's for a specific purpose. It's for a specific purpose. Yes. So this is, this, is a, this is a program for, specifically for high school students. For seniors who have seniors completed, only. seniors only, who have completed everything other than passing FCAT, and they have to have two credits currently from Pennsylvania in order to be able to receive their Pennsylvania diploma because FCAT is not a requirement. So that's the criteria for being able to be enrolled in Penn Foster versus virtual school or any other online Correct. program. In our history of enrollment for Penn Foster, are we, on, are we from the beginning of time that we started Penn Foster, which was how many years, how many years have we been I believe this is our fourth or fifth year. Okay. So are we on, on an incline with enrollment? Well, we've done several things with Penn Foster over the okay. years. Um, we started off, we actually even used some of our, I had some of our teen parent students um, enrolled in Penn Foster. That did not work as well because they didn't have the drive necessarily to complete the credits as quickly, but for a senior who sees that they know that either they're going to take FCAT, and typically the students that are, are in this group have already taken and failed FCAT four times, and so usually in October or so is when they realize I've got only one more chance so to take FCAT. So they are taking FCAT, a lot of times they're already taking ACT or SAT, and then we enroll them in Penn Foster as another opportunity. So they know that pretty much if they complete the Penn Foster, they're going to get a diploma. It's just, is it going to say State of Florida or is it going to stay State of Pennsylvania? And how does, so we've got 47 right now. How does the enrollment in the Penn Foster program, is it funded through Florida's FTE formula? How, is, how are those We actually receive because uh, the teachers have to be certified in Florida, okay. so we actually get FTE for that, but then we are, we pay for the actual credits to Penn Foster. Okay, okay, so we get it. We have the oversight of those dollars, and, when the, and then the, the, the agreement that we're going to Pass today, hopefully, you will be able to do a splitter. Is that how the mechanics of it work? Basically, okay. yes. Okay, thank you for explaining that. I appreciate your patience with that. <clears throat> thank you very much. Ms. Nobles, um, when it comes to Penn Foster, do you have off the top of your head, and it doesn't have to be a perfect number, but roughly how many students um, have we have graduated from Penn Foster in the last three, four years? I would say we've probably, in just like this year so far, we've had, uh, or last year, at the end of last year, had seven, um, and we still have some working. We probably have averaged about 10 to 12. And I would say that uh, in that, so that's about 40 or so. Um, 
and I know it's increased, if I recall, over the beginning, because we've been better at identifying and better. Um, better at identifying, but also when FGAP uh, last year moved from FGAT uh, mm -hmm. to FGAT 2.0, um, right now we're also taking a look at some of the students because this uh, graduating class will be the first graduating class that has to have geometry as well as algebra. They don't have to pass the EOC, but they do have to have the credit in geometry. Um, I was talking with Kristen at Penn Foster the other day to just make sure of what their math requirements, because that hasn't been a piece of, of the pie, so to speak, that we have looked at. And so, um, they are increasing their requirements for graduation in Pennsylvania, but so far they do not specifically say that it has to be algebra and it has to be geometry. And if I recall when you've presented to us in the past, um, this particular um, Penn Foster that is, as well as Pennsylvania, has been more flexible in accepting uh, certain uh, teachings or, or classes that we would have with our students in our system, they would accept as a comparable class for under the Penn Foster should we need to then enroll them in the Penn Foster diploma. Well, um, ba basically as long as they take two credits, um, that's all that they have to have. I mean, they have to meet the, I believe it's 21 credits required for graduation right. in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of those has to be a civics, but they will take U.S. government, which is what our students are in, uh, rolled in as well. Um, but when you take a look at it, their requirements very much mirror uh, the Florida requirements. Not as many electives are required. Uh, and right now, like I said, they are, their requirement still is math. It is not specifically algebra and geometry. Um, if I recall, those that ended up um, being enrolled in Penn Foster versus those that needed the Penn Foster uh, safety net, it seemed to be that about half ended up being able to pass the FCAT or the EOC after, that was generally, if I recall in my mind, well, is that? This, this most recent group out of the 47, 22 passed either FCAT or they received a concordant score on ACT. And, and again, I think why this board has been so supportive, and it's why I, I pulled this out because I was very, I'm very pleased with the Penn Foster results that we've gotten. And results because I sit there and think of those students, uh, those are saved students that we would not have had, they would have had to go for a GED option, um, and they wouldn't have had a full diploma. If I have a GED and I want to enroll in the armed services right now, what are my chances? Typically not because it's not considered as a diploma. But if I have a Penn Foster, and I know we've had a couple of times where we've had to do some things, do I have a much better shot? Because it is considered as a diploma, a state diploma. And I think that's where this board, and we talked about our goals and our objectives, it's Penn Foster has, I think, just been another of our toolbox. And um, no, when we look at the dollars, um, we always want to come up with what the results are, but. To me, we've got over 40 students we've saved, and I'll take those students and the money that we've spent any day of the week. Mr. Kennedy, Penn Foster is part of our October State of the History, so some of the questions you've asked, we'll be able to bring back for this week. Outstanding. Okay. Thank you. We'll make sure that's done. Okay. All right, do I have a motion? Uh, I move approval that we. Um, Purchase the additional site licenses for online access to 31 full credits of high school virtual courses from Penn Foster. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Deutschman. Do we have any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Okay, to approve the full uh, out of state travel for Coast River Middle School FFA members to attend. The Agricultural Expo in Moultrie, Georgia, on October 16th, 2013. And I pulled that and then I pulled the next one and you can send those two together. Oh, we can? Uh, it's for the high school, Christopher High School. I just noticed that. And the Expo in Moultrie, Georgia, same time. Uh, is there anyone who? I can address it. Okay. And why, why I pulled it, it I, this is one of my favorite places on earth, 
<laughs> I'm always Crystal sure. River High School is? Well, that is too, but <laughs> I, I, I was at Expo Sorry, in Brian, Boca, okay. Georgia, and I was wondering, I saw those two, and I was thinking this would be beneficial to every, all high schools, all middle schools, in you know, study agriculture. So why not all of them? I did notice that um, Canton High School chose to go another place, but I was wondering if we could not encourage. And Citrus is going another place okay. too. But if we could not encourage, even if they're going to another place, them to attend this because they used to go to this one, mm -hmm. Citrus, but they chose another expo to go to, mm -hmm. Ag Expo. Are they all FFA or some of them 4-H? Our schools go to all the FFA ones, okay. yeah. but there are, I'm sure, there's some 4-H ones, mm -hmm. and there'll be 4-H at Moultrie. Yeah, but some of the schools have decided to go to other expos that they found uh, so better the suits their needs. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you go to that? Yes, I love it. You go to the, the yes. Agriculture Expo yes. in Moultrie. I love it. It's fun. <laughs> I went one year with the kids from Citrus. They're trying to throw through your I know. I was just going to say, do you have a blue jacket too, an FFA jacket? I have one. I was just going to say, I should get one more. No, it's absolutely marvelous. It is. It shows them all the new equipment that's out. Technologies, the latest technologies. So, Ms. Powers, if we were to vote, can we vote for both of these? Yes, I oh, thank so. you. But I just want one last question. I want to make sure that the other middle schools also are exposed. If it's they're not this particular one, are they exposed to another agricultural expo? Yeah, but we don't. Uh, some of the ag programs are stronger at some middle schools right. than other, but yes. And we've had kids from other schools go with like this group or another high school group, we've had students they hitchhike. that, you know, if they were a smaller group or something, they would go with another group. So, so all the schools have some opportunity to go to some ag expo. I'm wondering if we could get Ms. Powers on as a, as a chaperone. These are actually done with their, their FFA clothes. It's not actually the class, it's yeah. the FFA clothes that's going. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking to someone who did Western pickup, guys. You know, I know this stuff. <laughs> All right, do I have a motion? I move to approve. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Powers. Both of me, I'll Second. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. We have a motion and a second on um, numbers 11 and 12. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Okay, school request to approve out-of-state travel requests for Denise Willis, director of the Bukuchi Technical Institute, to participate in the commission for the Council COE Fall Commission meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, September 13th through the 17th, 2013. Hi, Ms. Willis. Hi. And I also pulled this, and, and uh, there were other items on the yes. agenda. This was the uh, commission, uh, commission meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, what were the other two that you? Um, I'm going on a site visit to a private school in Las Vegas. It's a change of ownership. And I'm going to the National Conference in Dallas, and I'm a presenter. And the reason I pull it, to me, this is absolutely phenomenal that we have someone in Citrus County who has been recognized as the um, Woman of the Year. As, oh, thank you. Exactly, Woman of the Year, recognized throughout the nation as a person to present at conferences. You even have done it internationally. Yes. And you never blow your own horn, you never pat yourself on the back. So I pull this to be able to blow the horn for you and pat you on the back <laughs> and say you. we are very, very proud. Thank you so much. Yes. And she goes to other places and rates them. Yes, I did. That's the school visit. <laughs> yep. yes. And perhaps you and I can go to the Moultrie, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion? Is there still discussion opportunity here? There is, please discuss away. Uh, as far as the, the commitment that you have with yes. the organization, do you receive a salary from no. that at all? No compensation. No compensation. At all. And looking at your involvement with that organization, obviously it takes you out of the facility yes. um, significantly. I definitely respect and appreciate your commitment to that. Um, I want to know with that commitment, how is that impacting the student learning there at WTI? Mm -hmm. This is um, very beneficial to the school. Okay. Our, you have to be a, an accredited school to receive financial aid. By living, we live COE every single day. Um, the organization of the school is based on the COE protocol. It's not something that we do at the end of five years and say, oh my gosh, we have a team visit coming um, and we need to prepare. 
We do it every single day. We have a room that is dedicated to COE. There are 11 standards, 244 protocols that um, every day I'm putting something in the crate. If you've ever been on a SACS visit, you'll know that there are crates and documents. Um, actually, COE is moving to an electronic version. So we still have to have the crate, but eventually it'll be scanned and uploaded. Um, but the organization of the school is based on the COE protocols. And I feel that by being a commissioner, I am in the forefront of the changes that are occurring at the national level with the um, U.S. Department of Education, with the federal financial aid. We are in a good position to address those changes before they even come to us. We are putting um, protocols and policies and our own school policies in place. Thank We're ahead of the game. Yes. No, I remember I was there when the commission came through and yes. uh, you led them into the room and they were doing stuff and said, and you had to go do something else. So I'm listening to everything they're saying. And said. the other. And they were saying, these people are really. Yes. And they were so complimentary to yes. what was happening because it was all ahead of the game. It was all on top of it. So. Yes. And, um, you know, when I go on a school visit, I bring my, my camera, I take pictures of lots of, with school permission, lots and lots of equipment that I think is very, very beneficial to our programs. I bring back the syllabus from the programs. I bring back ideas for student services, um, ideas that we can better um, assist potential students upon entering WTI. Um, if you look at our webpage, I got that idea. I mean, it's all brand new. Um, it's, I, it's a twofold. I'm bringing back a lot of information to WTI. I am the only tech center in Citrus County. I can't pick up the phone and call you know, a principal at Citrus High School and say, hey, how are you doing something? Because they're not doing it the same way. We're, I can't call up Vernon Lauder at CF and say, hey, how are you doing this? Because it, his rules aren't my rules. So this is an excellent opportunity, I feel, for Citrus County, WTI, and my staff to be involved with COE. Thank you for the clarification. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Ms. Willis. Do we have a motion? I move to approve the out-of-state travel request for the school district to participate in the commission for the council COE fall commission meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, from September the 13th. Second. And a second. We have a motion by Ms. Powers and a second by Ms. Balfour. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Okay, I need a motion to approve the minutes. Move approval of the minutes. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Kennedy and a second by Ms. Balfour. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Attorney Legal Matters. Mr. Mullen, do you have anything that needs to come before the board? Ms. Balfour? Ms. Powers? Yeah. Silly I, me. I, just, I thought you were three in a row. I just want to mention, um, I know that Citrus High School, the drama department is going to New York City on July the 26th, and they're going to visit the Rockettes. And I just wanted for general information, everyone to mention that Suzanne Webb exactly. was a Rockette. She was a Rockette. was a Rockette. In and Life Magazine. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I need to call over at Citrus High and uh, tell that to them, because Suzanne, I asked her yesterday, I said, would you be willing to you know, impart some information? She said yes. So um, we have good resource right here in Citrus County. All right. Um, Secondly, donation of the businesses in the community. I, uh, you know, I, I deal with the Festival of the Arts, and there were some um, items needed for the kids to do some stuff. But I went to some businesses and asked for them, and they were so good about the Ace Hardware, Walmart, my husband. <laughs> so that, uh, that they just gave what was needed, and I was so pleased that they did, that they did that. So uh, I know in the newspaper you're always saying how generous the people are this county are, which is the truth. Uh, third thing, I, I visited the three high schools this week in connection with supplies and, and getting them out. And I just wanted to come, every high school was doing so beautifully. I wanted to comment particularly on Crystal River High School and the atmosphere at that high school. Walking in, the students, I, I, I couldn't find any students. They were all in their classes. Really? Changing them, whether it's time to change, quietly changing. 
the way the school is built uh, has lent, lent itself to that type of uh, change in classes. But Linda Connors lends herself to truly an organized unit. And I, I was completely impressed with it. I hope Linda isn't watching. I want to get the video. <laughs> but it was absolutely outstanding. Um, of the handbook. You worked so hard on that technology part of this baby. Make sure all the rules were totally understood. And I wanted to say, you did a wonderful job. And I'm we sorry. did. It's I'm a, it was very effort. much a collaborative all effort. effort. <laughs> and the other members of the board, every single one of them, uh, <clears throat> added something, asked, asked us to take it to the meeting, and we did. Um, I know Ms. Georgeman had some clarification she wanted. I, I uh, brought it in at that moment. I had forgotten. I had to take an, an email it in to make sure it was part of the discussion. So uh, Ms. Bryant and I worked on it too. <laughs> there was my little pen about the, the A's and the D's, and you're right, because they all make a difference. And I know Mr. Bradshaw, uh, when you heard the question about the shalls, we're always asking you that. We want to put it in, but we can't legally. That's, we can't change the legal language. So. Uh, so I just wanted to say kudos to the board because they really worked hard. I'm sure dozens and dozens of hours on making this handbook. We do it every single year. And the last, the last point, um, I was talking to Mrs. Fitzpatrick, and you know, we've been talking about getting a picture of Spike to put on the wall. And uh, so we talked about a time to do this, thinking about uh, now. December or January, we're thinking about in November the 26th, but it looks like we're not going to have that meeting uh, on, the, in, on the 26th. So we're now looking at December and January. So I'll be back with the date to you when that's decided. She'll call me back and we'll do it. So it's prepared to do right. the dedication. Great. That's it. On that end, Ms. Powers, um, Mr. Mr. Bernarami had done a wall plaque in, in Spike's office that had a picture of him and it had the Irish prayer. Oh. And we asked Sean a number of years ago if we could duplicate that. And Aldo has the picture, and he's always offered to reproduce that. Um, I don't know why it's taken five or six years for anything to come on the, you know, about once a year we ask, and we have some sort of commemoration to the circuit statute. I don't know if it's still been kind of a raw subject for his family, um, but Sean was very supportive of the whole idea. Um, so there's also Mr. Bernarami as a resource because he did a beautiful job in the one in the spec office in the lobby if you've ever seen it. Trina? Maybe so, so you'd like to explore Well, that. if you look at that, and it it's, really, good it's great. It's a great picture, and it's also a very nice tribute because it's not on his headstone to the Irish prayer. It's on his bench, I think. By, by, at his gravesite. I think he worked with me as an elder. You know, I'll, I'll bring it up again. She's going to be on vacation for another week, uh, true. Uh, but after she gets back, I'll discuss it. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, I've got some stuff. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I had met um, on August 30th, we had, or I should say Dr. Geddes had the uh, Educational Technology Council Committee, which uh, I sit on. And I think I sent you all the, a link to the video, A Day Made of Glass 2, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, yeah, and, and it's by Corning. And so it's, and I find it interesting because it's their day of glass. They've, the first one was very empowering. This one, because it was based on education, I think what was interesting to us is that as we watched it, we were seeing what really is happening and we are in the middle of. It's so often, you know, you, I think of people who talk about the 1960 World Fair in New York City and they would t show you what the world of tomorrow would look like. I was there in oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I've read about it in books. <laughs> and, and, the, and the idea of what it was, you know, there's some things, they had like picture phones, and, but you think about now, so much of that is the reality. I mean, even I, I joke as a trucker, you know, that the communicator is, I mean, we passed the communicator now. And um, so th that technology meeting, I have so much respect. Um, Doc does a great job at facilitating it. At that meeting, though, um, because it has morphed over the years, you have 
um, the technology specialists at the schools, or what is referred to as the technology specialists, the TOSA media, or media TOSA that we've uh, now had, you have just technology ed educators, and then you also have the, the kind of technology um, tech people, um, the technology aides, I mean. And these are the people that are on the ground floor, floor of instituting so much of what we have going on in the school. And so often I, I you know, and I, I think if you have watched or as you have watched what this board has worked to accomplish, I so much regularly say what we're seeing when it comes to one-to-one -to -one technology isn't about technology as much as it is about instruction. And that embracing has been so exciting. I was, this week, I was at uh, Chris River Primary and Lacanto Primary. And their, their use of Mimeos, and I have to remind those of us who've been around a long time, a Mimeo is not a machine that you cranked out, that cranked it out purple, <laughs> that, uh, that smelled so intoxicating. Um, but a Mimeo is a smart board, and it's a smart board um, that the the teachers use, those smart boards used to be like $2,600 a piece. The Mimeos, they get them now for about $600 a piece. So many of our schools have been using their SAC funds, uh, PTA funds, and they have them in many of the schools, Crystal River Primary is an example, in every classroom. So like the black boxes that this board put in that have been, I believe, again, the beginning stages of a fundamental change in instruction, the Mimeos have also picked up. And what the technology specialists you know, will sh tell you and show you is this is about, it's a technology tool, but it's been about instruction. The teachers are using that instruction to engage students and make it relevant and go deeper. All of the pieces of common core standards, not assessment, <laughs> but in standards. Um, I think one of the things, though, that in the meeting was clear was the challenges that this has placed. We now have six sites that have a tremendous amount of more technology in them. And what that involves and how each of their roles is continuously changing. One of the things that just to me becomes, and it's, I know it's kind of out there that we're going to take on, but is the issue of the TOSA media, the media TOSA and the job description for that because schools are each approaching it very differently. And I, I, it's not to say that it's not working at their individual schools, but some schools have a TOSA media, a technology person, and they also might have a media specialist or what was a media specialist or a library aide. And it's different from school to school and how they use those resources. And I think, though, one of the pieces that seems to be clear is that need to establish a technology, media, however we want to call it, PASCO calls it a super specialist, but of defining some of those, those roles and expectations because what's clear is the amount of work. Um, and I, if I can show it up here, today I was at IMS because they are rolling out the iPads right now uh, at IMS. Oh shoot, Docker, but it's not going to do it. Um, it's not. That's okay. Um, but one of the things, and I'll see if I can just hold it up and, sh and share it to you guys. They're uh, they're they're handing out the iPads, but this is the difference of a year ago. A year ago, we were just happy to get the iPads into students' hands. <laughs> now the students have um, the each iPad came out with a little label on it that had all of the various logon information, their own individual, and I, I had them take out their IDs, uh, their passwords, but their own individual email address, their logins to their Skyward accounts so that they can check their grades. And the students were then, as the, as the tech team, as Doc's team was, was uh, showing them how to enter all of that, and they didn't leave until they had all of that in place, but the seamlessness of it. We were happy again to just hand them out last year. This year, they, they were actually walking away with a knowledge of what to do with those. And I've, I've told some of the teachers, 
cherish tomorrow because it'll be the only day you're going to be an expert on that iPad to those students. And whose idea was it to change the way they were distributed and handed out? I think the improvement came from your team, Doc, didn't it? Too? Yeah, just kind of analyzed what worked well, and um, we've learned a lot the past year, so it's helped. And, you know, I think last year there was about 300, 350 deployed. This year, 1,200? 1,800. 1,800. So the process needed to get, you know, smoother, but um, very, uh, it, it was exceptional to see. Um, following that, and, and to give just an indication of, of where our district is going and where this takes off, um, Apple had uh, called me last week, um, one of the representatives that Doc had, um, had introduced me to, um, wanted to talk about where we're doing and what we've done, um, and just shared out how our district, and, and literally said, you are one of two districts that aren't just implementing technology. He says there's a lot of, a lot of comp, um, districts out there that are spending more, whether it be Apple money in Apple or other districts in money. But it's so, it's very calculated how you're doing it and how you're tying it to instruction. And he said there's other districts that are putting it out there, but they're not tying it to instruction the way Citrus has. And I will tell you, going around Crystal River Primary last year, and we can't do primary last year. I was at home with Sasa yesterday, yesterday, and this guy was, he had kids doing smart board stuff. I just, exactly. oh, that's and awesome. That is, Old home with Sasa. And, and that technology, <laughs> and what's really great is that, or not that technology, that instruction is so easy, or much easier for those teachers to then transfer that to one-to-one -one and go deeper with those students. I've had teachers say, you know, the Mimeo's great, but now I've got four groups and four kind of levels. With the iPads or with a one-to-one -one technology, I can have every student at their level. Because everybody was engaged. And everybody was engaged. And, and you know, um, a, a big piece is just because students are compliant doesn't mean they're engaged. And the difference is when I go there, I can go up to the student and I'll say, tell me what you're doing. I am blown away by when they talk to me about the depth of it. Now, their depth may be different depending on the student and their own ability, but I love it's individualized. And, and I've talked before that, you know, Gates and, um, and Jobs, before he passed, they each have said the critical need for the future is for individualized instruction in our school. And I know we've recognized that by small group instructions and those trends. But this is, is truly um, it. But I thought when Apple sits there and says, you may not be spending the most dollars, but you are clearly spending the best dollars. And that is going to make a major impact in the savings, I believe, in our district over the coming years. I know that nut seems awfully big at times. It is awfully big. But I think what is clear is that there's a lot of districts spending money and not knowing what direction they're going. We, I think, are farther along because we know what we're doing, or it was certainly more so than I think our competitive districts. That's not been anything new, and I go back to the black boxes, because you all, you know, even some of the less technology-oriented board members here have recognized, you know, that um, you didn't have to be a geek to appreciate that that was about putting in good instruction tools. So I hold that up to you um, because I do think it was important to, uh, to see. Um, at the same time, I got a call from the library services about non-duplicating of services. They wanted to meet, basically. And uh, so I asked Dr. Geddes, the public, the, thank you, the public library. So I asked Dr. Geddes if he would keep me out of trouble and, uh, and, and go along with me. And, uh, Ms. Hemmel um, was, uh, was good with that. And one of the things that um, they are doing is they recognize they have got to be more relevant in, to their students. Challenges they are having is they have reduced budgets. They have less need for, for real physical books and a demand, growing demand, for ebooks. 
challenge that they have is, of course, how do we accomplish that? Well, of course, when we explain to them that, well, they just got 1,800 new users wanting ebooks, that in the subsequent years they're going to have, you know, near 10,000 students that will have new new young people that are going to have the ability to check out these ebooks. They want to be spending their dollars where it makes sense, and so. There was some great conversation about trying to have Doc's team sit down with their team to say, okay, how do we make sure that, that, that they're aware of what we're doing so they can plan for it? Because what they're finding right now is they've got great usage of students zero to five and great usage for students 55 and older. But the in-between are, are wanting services but they don't necessarily want to go to a building to do that. And so they're, they're creating, you know, they're having those same kind of media challenges. Um, so I think it was a productive, it was really, the biggest thing came out of it is the next piece I'm talking about, and that was that uh, the library is going to go to EdCamp, which is coming up, and do a presentation to the teachers about, they use a system called Overdrive, and that allows us, and if you have an iPad or a Kindle or whatever the case is, you can check out uh, their eBooks. And they use a system called Overdrive, so they're gonna give a demonstration how to teachers to use it so they can help inform their students how to utilize it, check out books from the library using their iPads. Uh, and I would note too, our library system, we converted over, what's the name of it, Doc? Our um, program, De Fo De Fo Destiny? Yes, Destiny. Destiny is the program that our students use to check out books now. That program, Citrus Springs Middle School, is piloting because it allows ebook checkouts from our current system. So they're actually utilizing that to check out our own books. What's neat about that is a school could conceivably purchase a book that they keep just at the school digitally and the students check out, or it could be done where the district purchases it, and then it could be checked out by any student in the district. So, schools are loading books on Kindles and then checking the Kindle out. Right, and the challenge with that is that book, because of the agreement that Amazon and Barnes and Nobles have with the publishers, is that it has to be tied to that only device. So, and I get a little frustrated with that because I'm like, well, wait a minute, we buy ten e-books and they can only be on one device instead of going out to 10 students i'd rather have the books then and they don't have the device so this allows them that they actually can do that so but ed camp um i unfortunately in, in this year not going to be able to attend and it's breaking my heart but i would want to let board members know on september 28th at this year new location the state-of-the-art Crystal River High School is going to host EdCamp. EdCamp Citrus has become the largest EdCamp in the southeastern United States. It is one of the largest now in the country. It is uh, founded and organized by Jerry Switek, which is one of our technology specialists. But it, uh, all of our technology specialists, Dr. Geddes, our teachers, our iPad teachers, they all present at it. Um, it. It has been at the catalyst, in my opinion, of going to that and then going out to the schools afterwards and seeing how that has changed, again, instruction in such a positive way. Um, so I would remind us as a board um, the things that we've used in the past to make decisions when it comes to technology, and I, and I leave you with this, and that is, that we continue to make these decisions based on what is easy for teachers for instruction in the classroom uh, when it comes to technology and transferring it, making it engaging for students and relevant to the world that they're going to enter. I think this board and this executive team has done that and I look forward to continuing that because I think it is just remarkable what's out there. Thank you.
last week. And Sunday, we're at uh, lunch at, uh, at Hope Lutz in the little cafeteria, which I love. And there is a woman there who's very patiently talking to what seemed to be her grandson. He was sort of biggish. She wasn't a little boy. He was more like middle school. And she has her notebook, and she's teaching him how to write letters, letter by letter. So she says, and, you know, and, and the C starts the same as the A, and then she does the G, and has to have a certain slant. And I'm like, gosh, this sounds so familiar, like in third grade, that it's so precise. And he's, she gives him a notebook, and he writes the letter. And I'm looking at him, and he's looking like he's around, you know, 12 or something at least. And he's really, really paying attention to her, and she is so patient. Oh, that's a beautiful letter. So, of course, I couldn't help myself. I went you couldn't help yourself, I know. <laughs> said to Grandma. I said, um, I said, oh, I think you're working on cursive, I said. And the boy said, um, so is this something new for you? And he said, I don't, know, I don't know how to write it, and I don't know how to read it. So I have a big conversation with Grandma, who I say, you seem like you're a teacher. Yeah, I was a teacher for 50 years um, in Colorado. The mom told me. Well, they, in third grade, they said cursive wasn't required, and so they just didn't teach it at all. This is a conversation we've had on this board uh, over the last year. And the grandmother was writing him letters in cursive, he couldn't read it, and he said his teacher writes notes in cursive, and he can't read them. So um, the grandmother was taking the time to teach this boy, and he was already like middle school. And said, boy, what a sad commentary. It's not simple to tell. Yeah, that we all don't even think twice about, but our kids are being denied that opportunity to learn um, that also keeps them from reading very important information. You know, so I'm really glad that we had that workshop uh, last year and our commitment, I hope we still have a strong commitment to making sure that our kids learn cursive, but also that it gets reinforced in later years, not just third grade. You know, that's how we do that so that kids continue to write it rather than just learn it once and then that's it. But for some reason, they always go back to the. They all do go back, to, go back to, to printing. printing. Some of our sixes on FCAT are all printed. I was yeah, going to say, I think the, the FCAT writes, is it not that most of the teachers teach it as print, Mr. Clotter? Because I know, I know my fourth grader, the, the teacher said, I don't want you doing cursive until after the rights. Really? Because it was, yeah. So now they're right. going to type it in another year. So what difference does it make? Well, that's this is it. really sad because you know we're not even going to teach kids to print anymore. We're going to teach them keyboard skills in kindergarten. There are a lot of districts that just cut it out. Yeah, it's it's you know, and I felt I felt you know sad that there's an entire state of kids who won't be able to write or read cursive. And thank goodness you have a grandmother who can. I don't do uh, uh, Egyptian um, hieroglyphics. hieroglyphics anymore either. <laughs> I'm totally messing with you. Don't you change. Give that to Ms. Powers, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So the other question I have for you, I'm going to the safety committee uh, Thursday because they didn't know I was on it. And then once they found out they were on it, they started sending me a judge. Well, you're the one who said you. Yeah. I, I never, um, no wonder our meetings were going I've so. I've only gotten one notice of an advisory council meeting this year. Are you all I emailed all of mine. That's a good idea. I didn't. I, I just didn't emailed all of mine. I need to do that. Okay. But I probably not, Cheryl, a good, Cheryl, not a bad idea. And she gave me mine, but she said, "You're lucky because I have these. I, there are a bunch I don't have." You know, I think uh, Miss Hemmel, if you could, I know you're mm -hmm. Mr. Muller because Miss Hemmel's going to tell. Could somebody please remind Mr. Hebert? Uh, is he the one who has inherited advisory yes. councils? Yes. Would you send your email? Oh, you know, Mr. Clark, if Sorry. you could remind if Mr. Hebert's going to be the one coordinating. I have a document on my desktop I will send to you. <laughs> We're missing about two more schools. So I do have the so dates. The dates and time. Yes, ma'am. But can you make sure they know that yes. they need to notify us? Yes. And don't wait for us to show up and sign up on the list because if they don't send us an agenda or meeting notice, a lot of times it doesn't get put on our calendar. And I had one school last year that I went to the first two meetings and I had their calendar and then they changed it twice and they never ever sent me a notice or an agenda again. And I find them by the end of the school year, I said to myself, you know, what happened to that school? <laughs> I went over there, they never mentioned anything. It was just really strange. We yeah. have those that are in charge of the committees. 
Put us on your email list. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they issued their sentence. Put us on the email list. And I still get invited to bunch of them. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. So I try to forward them to whoever I am. Yeah, it's good. And in Crystal River, they must have felt we were teaming up on because that was a really Yeah, they. I had the, the luxury of, they asked me to speak to the fourth graders for their SAC um, elections. Oh, fun. So, I was really, it was fun. I took my iPad and I did a PowerPoint from the iPad. To the, <laughs> so, they're so cool. They couldn't get Hamill, so they called me. <laughs> Last year I had one girl say, you always vote for your friends? My friends are just friends. Are you having the SAC, have SAC come to the SAC training? I just made a note to myself about calling Mr. Peeper about that because um, I told him he needed to bug me about it because he's, his scheduling, I don't know what he's doing, but he hasn't bugged me, so I'll go bug him. Okay. And I'll make sure that I, as I come out to the SAC, so yeah. you remind them that. We that. typically do it maybe the last week in October or whatever, but we just, I have all my stuff together. I've got it all gathered up, but I need to sit down with him. That's mine. Yeah, that's the one I'm making. Yeah. Miss Nobles and I. In fact, um, Miss Miss Worthington has agreed to brave it out with me this week, and she's going to go to the SAC meeting, and we're going to show her a tour of the uh, of Cypress Creek. So it's actually a lot of fun. Have you been out there at all, Miss Belfort? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you so when you go, just remember something. Because anyway, you're going to have to leave it at the front. Yes. Everything. And it takes quite a while to get through. You have to stand outside, buzz the buzzer, and have buzz it again, buzz it again, and then you have to you have to negotiate all. Your, you know, it, it, so if you're going to go, you plan like what 20 minutes yeah. to get to the secure. It's like going to the airport. And then they you take your shoes off, and then they scan you. <laughs> it's really, it's interesting going to a school board, uh, going to a meeting involving school board where you have to get scanned in yeah. and I was thinking when Mr. Kennedy was talking about the graduations that I've been to those graduations yes. and that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, I was asked to speak at home at Sasa Elementary for the, they did the then and the now and I was the then. <laughs> because I used, to, I used to attend that school, oh, but so not funny. that particular building, because the building I attended, we had a picture of the two-story building that I attended, and it was so beautiful and gothic, yes, yes, and uh, red brick, a beautiful building that burned after I graduated from high school, but it burned, and um, so the teacher did a Venn diagram of all the events and now. <laughs> and there were a couple of things, and that's why I got to go across the, the hall and talk to the, but I didn't talk to the teacher, I just watched this teacher. And he, he was so um, engaging of all the students with the smart board, it's excellent. But anyway, that, that was just a little bit of it. And I went back over and I talked to third graders about the things that we did back in the 50s. And, <laughs> and we, could, we didn't talk about that. I should have brought Kristen up. Uh, if I had known. <laughs> but we did talk about the mimeograph machine. Purple. That, that, Purple. Yeah, that smelled so wonderful. And the shiny oh, you did the paper? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You said, what do you think? You said limo. Mimeo? Yeah. I've been trying to think what it's called. Mimeograph machine. Yeah, we talked about that. And one of the things, two, two things that were the same, well, we had principles. Um, kickball. Those guys love kickball, and we had kickball back in the day. So anyway, um, and tonight I'm going on my way to Pensacola. Since I'm on the board of directors, there's a board of directors meeting, and our Say president lives in Pensacola, <laughs> so that's where we're meeting. So tomorrow for Florida School Board or Florida School, for, uh, Florida School Board Association okay, board of sure directors. No, that'll be later. No. That'll be in October. <laughs> Save us money. I'm, I'm going to, going to. Um, does anybody have anything else? I just want to ask Mr. Uh, oh, Dr. Geddes, if he could take, take um, Thomas's iPad and put it in hieroglyphics. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably an app for that. Yeah, I, 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 There's an app for that. 
But mine, in, in Chinese by accident, it was just a little doing, but I'm sure I'm doing it. I feel like you have to probably read Chinese. Yeah. Cryptic. Or remember yeah. where you hit the button. Oh yes. They remember that. The other thing I found, it, when that happens, uninstall it and install it again. <laughs> if worse comes to worse, it'll reset. Okay, that's fine. That was an excellent one, too. That's scary. Excellent. That's scary. I want to ask the board. Um, Mr. Tom, uh, Kennedy brought up a topic about media specialist technology, specialist technology aides. And at one point when we talked about consolidating media specialists like in the elementary world, and I know that Kennedy talked earlier about savings, we know that there'll be close to $400,000 savings by consolidating a couple of those jobs and rewriting that job description for the media specialist would also be the technology person. So if you all want us to pursue that, we will pursue that. The job description will back in a workshop, talk about it, and if not, then it's a dead issue. If you all would like us to clean that way, we'll go through. Can we afford to have both of them? No, we will consolidate. Because a lot of our elementary schools have technology aids. <coughs> so that position would <coughs> be eliminated, and then we our media, express, our media person would be technology slash media or TOSA or whatever we want to call them where they could have more than technology that time. Well, yeah. One thing I did notice at the end, he obviously had the same experience, that the school site management team are all doing a little bit of a different thing with their media departments. Mm -hmm. With feedback from the principals or the administrative teams, are they, are they getting a, a good feel for what would benefit them as far as their organizations? Structure? They spoke out last time as to what they wanted. So is this they the could direction? still hang on to an instructional staff person and that be technology media where they could work that in. Because some of them teach more classes and some of them teach a couple of classes yeah. and still have a little bit of flexibility there, but they would also, they would not lose the technology themselves. The wheel became a conversation right. regularly and each, again, each school does that wheel a little differently in how they're doing it. And then, you know, it's it's the difference between elementary and middle. You know, those become issues. I think one of the things, my own feeling would be, is that I think a lot of these schools are still figuring some of this through. Uh, and I would point to Crystal River Primary and with Hanville Primary who have, you know, the, you know, are the two that sites that have the one-to-one -one initiative ongoing right now. Since we're not gonna, be doing the, um, we won't have the um, um, site plans, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, my, it's getting late in my head, so it's spinning, the, um, the staffing plans, we wouldn't be doing till much you know, later into the year. Should we give it some time for the schools themselves to, to see what they are seeing? And before we get into them creating a job description that maybe they don't even know entirely what that looks like because I, I think the principals need to you know meet with with mr mullen and go through at least a half a year i just think what we need to do is if we are going to do something we do it in enough time for those principals to you know to have that input and then us be able to come up with that job description so that if there needs to be changes by the end of the school year that's and all i agree with that but i also want to be time sensitive to those people in those positions yeah you know, so if we do give them time and start at least having that conversation with the principals, where they can start <clears throat> as they're in the schools every day, seeing what's going on, seeing what the needs are, and start putting their heads together, they could work together, come up with some of the ideas that they need in those positions, and then we could, you know, get them. But I would say that with storage, I'm just one, <laughs> I'm just one point. Training, members, so. too, is an issue if you're combining and one person's wearing both hats and then everyone on pressure loses. Yes. And see, like there is what you know. One school, they are the technology teacher to the students. They are the technology person that's troubleshooting for the school, and they are also then the technology person for providing professional development to the teachers as well. So they're they're wearing all of these roles, and then while they're doing that, there may be a media specialist. <laughs> so that's where that's where they're and and it's trying to balance that. Yeah, I just want to make sure. From the board at this point, if you could just restate what it was that started this initial dialogue. We had talked at one time a few months ago to eliminate the media specialist last year and put a technology or a media aid in the um, media center. And 
then part of the conversation turned around that maybe a media person needs to have more technology background or expertise where we can consolidate that job along with the aid rather than having a technology person and a media person and an aid. And the principals have said that one of the things they recognize is with with both Common Core as well as the changes in the test, as well as now the fact that technology legislation is mandated that we're going to have to do 50% of our individual text must be digitalized. Well, they said now they need they are needing that need is growing, and yet they also don't want to take away from traditional pieces we had in the school. It's a time sensitive issue. So with with the time sensitive concern. Your, your question to the board is permission to move forward and to go ahead and work with the principals to see if, you know, for them to give us some feedback from the, you know, from the elementary world, bring that back to the board and we can workshop it and say, here are the needs of the schools, here's what we need to look at, and that way by January, February time frame, if that was a decision by the board, we could go out to staff and say, here's what we're consolidating. Well, I think it's important that we offer the opportunity for dialogue. Because back to the time sensitive issue and the fact that we have staff and plan ahead of us. And this is something that if if this is a potential direction that we're gonna to have to go in because of budget constraints, we need to be ahead of the game and not behind. The ch and I agree. The challenge I think is is like many of those schools have just gotten mm -hmm. some of the one to one into their schools. I don't think the principals really know what they need to we, know we for us. So yeah, no, I think that's appropriate, but I think that it's probably going to be a couple of months before they even have a feel. I mean, we could easily ask you to have a meeting tomorrow. No, we could easily have a conversation with principals, tell them that this may be an option down the road, and for them to start looking at some of the principals and tell them that this may be an option down the road, and for them to start gathering their ideas and talking with each other in, in the school to see what their needs are. And I think they're going to need to talk to those schools that are transitioning now and understand, okay, this is what we found worked, this is where we have needs. Um, you know, LPS has got, um, you know, Bart Adams, who I have to lift out because he just does an amazing job of what he's doing there. And he's been a huge asset there. Not every school's got a Bart Adams. And um, he's going to do wonderful things at that school. But well, that's, that's the point. That's the we thing. need the time to plan and look at the needs of each facility and try to see how they can possibly move through a transition if necessary. And hopefully, it won't be necessary. I mean, we're still looking at January, February time frame. Yeah. But at least let them start. Well, I think the idea too was to allow flexibility so mm -hmm. that schools, sometimes it's not uh, position driven or the needs of the school driven. It's yeah. the person that's there. The Absolutely. So you try to pat, match up the people that have the best knowledge, skill, expertise, and passion for something with what needs to be done at the school. And it may not always be the same person, the same position. So the more flexibility we can offer, the more school can, you know, utilize those two to the best ability. But, but and I agree with that, but then the, that question, that's why I think that job description flexibility needs to be there, which is kind of, I that's think, was the, the that's why we call it a TOSA, <laughs> except what I, but, what I think we have to be careful is, is in allowing that, are there now two positions at a school when we intended there to be one? That one happen. Yeah, no, I know, that's what I said. <laughs> She's guarding the door, yeah. guarding the door. Okay, I want to thank Mr. Clotter for sending us the SAAC dates. Thank, thank you. you. You're just too good to us. And, and it's a great example because Mrs. Brian just showed me I have two meetings next week that I didn't know about. So how come we're not in, I, I don't know why we're not in the work on this one. We're in the process of putting them on the district calendar, but again, I think what we're still trying to do is get them from all the schools, the but dates. the question is, have the schools been notified about which board members? Oh, yes. And oh, then, man, yes. And then, with requests that they send us uh, an email. And, and I got something from Homosassa. So thank you for coming to visit our third grade students. In so many ways, it was perfect. You're being there representing the Homosassa <laughs> Elementary as the then <laughs> makes the comparison of the now real and concrete. There you have it. <laughs> then and now. Yeah. I would, would you? Love that. Would you? <laughs> I would love that. Does anybody else have anything?
anybody have anything else? This meeting is adjourned.